Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, as usual, uh, um, at this point, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off uh, mobile phones and other wireless devices, um, um, as they can sometimes interfere with um, the sound system and, and dis disrupt the, 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 the meeting. But I should also point out that officials uh, and members are using some, uh, you know, tablet devices, but instead of their, their hard copies of, of their papers. The first item on uh, our agenda today is a decision on whether to take item five in private. Item five uh, is our budget approach. Um, I am also asking for the committee's agreement to take future draft budget 2015-16 reports to the finance, uh, finance committee in private. Can I have the committee's agreement that we take item five in private? Thank you for that. We now um, move to uh, agenda item number two, uh, subordinate legislation, and we have one negative instrument before us this morning, uh, which is the Regulation of Care Social Services uh, Social Service Workers Scotland Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014 backslash 129. There has been no motion to annul. Uh, and uh, delegated powers and law reform um, the committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Um, uh, do the committee members, uh, do any committee member wish to make comment? No. Therefore, um, the, can I have agreement that the committee are agreed to make no recommendations? Maybe. Thank you for that. We now move to agenda item number three, uh, which is to continue to take evidence at stage one of the Food Scotland Bill. Um, we have one final round table of the week before we hear from the, uh, the, the Minister. And I think the, the, um, the, the, the meeting is small enough that we can revert to a preferred uh, situation, which is to, uh, is to introduce ourselves before the start of the session. My name is Duncan McNeill. I'm a convener of the Health and Sport Committee and MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde. My name is Ewan Morton, and uh, I'm Chief Executive of Quality Meat Scotland. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm Tony McCauley. I'm Trading Standards Partnership Manager for East Lothian Council and Mid Lothian Council. Lynette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, Gil Patterson, a member for Clydebank and Mulgay. Archie Anderson, President of the Association of Beat Inspectors. Colin Keir, MSP, Edinburgh Western Constituency. Richard Lyle, Central Region, MSP. Morning, I'm Colin Wallace. I'm the President of the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Ailey MacLeod, MSP for South Scotland. David Morrison, Head of Policy and External Affairs at the Scottish Retail Consortium. And Richard Simpson, MSP, Mid Scotland and Fife. Thank you all very much for that. We have um, just over a, um, an hour and ten minutes or so for, for, for the panel. Um, uh, the main purpose of these panels is to, to hopefully that there's a dialogue between the various people here in the panel, so we'll always get the, the precedent in terms of speaking and answers. Um, but first of all, we're going to call on Rhoda Grant to get us going and ask the first question, please. Um, can I ask um, what additional powers or responsibilities people think uh, the, the new agency should have, or indeed if there are powers and responsibilities that they have been given that they shouldn't have? Take us for that, Mr. Tony McCauley. I can really speak on, uh, in terms of feed enforcement rather than food, like that which has historically been a, a trade and standards uh, enforcement aspect. In terms of one of the areas that the food standards, the new food body could undertake, is there is a, a, a lack of capacity at local authorities on feed enforcement in terms of in, the official controls on feed enforcement. So I think it's possibly an, an area or a scope for the new food body to take some of that in centrally or almost a, a regionalisation of feed enforcement and building capacity through neighbouring authorities joining up. So maybe a lead authority aspect. So one authority would do it for, say, the east of Scotland, maybe one for the north-east, one for north-west, 
to build that capacity and to look at an, an economy of scale on enforcement because the capacity at local level and expertise is gradually diminishing. So I think that is something that the new food body could take a lead on and give it that momentum to actually drive up compliance with feed hygiene and feed enforcement. Anyone else? Colin Wallace. Thank you. Yes, uh, the Institute are very supportive of the proposals in relation to compliance notices and fixed penalty notices. Environmental health officers and other associated uh, food safety professionals do a lot of um, assistance and support and help, and they deal with enforcement issues too. However, we feel there's a gap at the moment in relation to really heavy enforcement as opposed to lighter enforcement. And what we feel is that there's some technical uh, offences that could be dealt with much better and much easily without criminalising a food business operator in relation to things like not registering their business or um, and other minor lower matters that are not necessarily linked to uh, public safety or food safety. Uh, they're still important and they still need to be dealt with. Uh, and I can instance, for example, the prohibition of spoken in public places. Fixed penalty notices were used very well in that. They weren't used that often, but they were used when they were required. And it, it, it doesn't criminalise people in, in terms of uh, trying to do what they're doing. And it's maybe poor intentions rather than uh, trying to mislead the public. Anyone else on the, the, the enforcement angle or indeed any broader um, issues? You'll, I'll take others and I'll come back to you. Just, just I guess, uh, uh, an additional point, the point that Tony made uh, in feeds inspections. You, you, the government has inspectors out on farm uh, from the Rural Payments and Inspection Department and I think uh, we should, with someone should have a look at that whole inspection process on farms so that we're not sending out different inspectors to inspect different things and try and join things up a little bit uh, and Scottish Government did have a, a very good mm -hmm. programme a while ago called Sears and that was a joining up approach but I think in this specific area of feeds inspection uh, there's scope for uh, some kind of streamlining on the number of inspectors that go to farms and how that can be done with a bit more joined up approach within the government departments. Just hearing you saying that, just to maybe get some of the others in, what, what prevents you from developing the strategies that you have suggested or indeed Colin Wallace have, has suggested currently at present? Why do we need the food bill to do these things? I take, taking Colin's point on the fixed penalty notices, and again, we've, we've historically in trade and standards um, been dealing with fixed penalties for quite a while now in terms of um, underage sales of tobacco, home report legislation, energy performance certificates, etc., where there's been a fixed penalty regime which has worked successfully. So I can see that idea of decrim not decriminalising, but having a lesser uh, penalty being, uh, being more advantageous. So I would Again, I would support Colin's point on that in terms of moving that forward. And I think in terms of feed, feed enforcement, it's at a very, very low level within local authorities at present. There, are, there is such a dichotomy between local authorities in Scotland. For instance, Edinburgh and Glasgow hardly do any feed inspections because they don't have that many farms. Whereas Inverness, Aberdeenshire and the, the, more, the more rural authorities have got those feed and food businesses um, so they have, they have driven up some standards internally, but across the board in trade standards and to a certain extent in environmental health, that capacity and resources diminishing as, as councils themselves reduce the headcount with, of staff. Um, and it's actually maximising the staff that we've got. So some form of joined up approach, uh, be it on a regional basis, inter-authority basis, would, I would hope, would drive up those standards and drive up those competencies. But I think, following on from that in terms of scripted and animal health, there has to be a more joined up approach of passing intelligence and information to each other in terms of who's been inspected, when they're inspected, so that there's no duplication. I think that's extremely important. We've, we do have diminishing resources, so we need to use them effectively. I suppose the question I was trying to get at, Ms McCauley, was what prevents you doing that now? There's no legal impediment. I mean, I can see the Food Standards Agency mm -hmm. being a driver for, for, yes. for such or that, but is there anything that prevents you actually working closer together now 
and you know, mm -hmm. using those limited resources to a better effect. There's anything in prevention you doing that now? I think there's some stumbling blocks over Scottish Government and local authorities in terms of data protection and data sharing. Right. I think that, that there are some obstacles with that. that I, I don't think they're obviously insurmountable. But I think that's one of the main reasons which, which I'm aware of, that there have been data protection issues of us passing information in our database to, to Scripped, to Scottish Government um, and to Animal Health and, uh, Agency. You want to back in? Yeah. Just uh, an ancillary point on that. I, I think it's as simple as the I-Bean syndrome. It's I-Bean that way and that's the way it works. And I think the new Food Standards Scotland gives us an opportunity to act as a catalyst to actually review all this, uh, these areas and take a view on it and do it with a more sensible approach uh, for the betterment of uh, food safety in Scotland. Okay. Rod, Ro, did you want, uh, I know Bob wants to ask another question, but do you want to uh, follow up on any of that? Yeah, I suppose what I'm asking is, um, given that, and I understand it, are, are you suggesting that um, because the inspection regime currently falls to local government, that they would work with Scottish government departments who are going out um, doing farm inspections, head counts and the like. Um, and would that involve a degree of training for inspectors because they're going out doing one piece of work if they're going to then go and check something else? How much training would that... Because that, I could see that would be a barrier given costs and knowledge and, and the like. Any responses? I could come back. Yes, go on. I think that they would really need to be some form of scoping exercise to see to see exactly what you wanted the Scottish Government enforcement staff to do. It may well be you could look at a partnership approach between local authority staff and Scottish Government staff in the very early stages to build that capacity and build that expertise and the transferable skills from local authority staff onto Scottish Government staff. So there could, it could be a, a two-stage approach in terms of looking at the actual problem in the beginning and working together on it and then if there's a necessary capacity within Scottish Government staff, that they would get that through training through local authority staff. Oh, yes, go on. Do you want me to respond to that? Well, sorry, it's just another, another point in the general area of uh, wh where we need to have th this legislation is covering, and it's the area of food labelling. And uh, we feel in Quality Meat Scotland that not enough uh, weight is given to protected food names. An example of protected food name is Scotch beef, Scotch lamb. Those are the two that Quality Meat Scotland operates on, on behalf of the industry. But other examples are Abroth Smokies and you know the, the PGI, the Protected Geographical Indication. So we, we feel that uh, there, we should make sure with the new food body there is a, a good, robust approach to these protected food names which are given that status because of the quality. And these products usually have a premium in the market. And we need to ensure that there's uh, no uh, scope for food fraud, i.e. passing off other less, more inferior inferior products, uh, passing them off, for example, beef from another place, uh, for example, Ireland or Argentina or, or, or wherever, which is cheaper, uh, which is passed off as Scotch beef. So we need to make sure the labelling regime is taking account of the protected food names. Okay, I'm sure we'll go back to the labelling because there's been some issues there as well. Bob, did you want to address some of the earlier issues? It was just on Mr Wallace's comment, which was interesting. It's just um, the nuts and bolts of the bill, I suppose. So I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. So the, the, the idea of fixed penalty notices, your support of all... The, the fine scale you're supportive of, but you, you're maybe querying whether or not it would be it would be focused on the idea of food safety and food fraud rather than administrative bureaucratic breaches, which you said could be dealt with much more in a streamlined fashion, I think is what you were saying. I don't want to put words into your mouth. I was trying to be clear in what specifically you were saying in relation to that. Well, there are enforcement provisions available just now, but they can end up in the court. Uh, referral to procurator fiscal okay. and that's maybe a sledgehammer to crack a nut in a lot of regards uh, we're looking at slightly lower level offences here I know that the uh, convener has said that we're moving on to labelling issues I mean currently there are uh, powers in, uh, available in relation to labelling of unsafe food but there aren't any powers in relation to dealing with 
food that is incorrectly labelled and it uh, has an, it's a food standards issue. So there are enough powers out there to deal with food that's potentially unsafe and environmental health uh, professionals can actually deal with that. Uh, but food of a lower uh, safety level, uh, and it doesn't mean to say that food that's incorrectly labelled couldn't ultimately turn out to have a food safety implication or a food safety issue. That could be much better dealt with using these lower level issues. Right, okay, maybe I, I, I misunderstood Mr Wallace, because I, I thought I was looking at the bill as you were talking and um, it seems as if this will be dealt with in, in regulation. So the idea of a relevant offence will be specified in, in relation to regulations as laid by Scottish ministers. Did you just want to make sure that yes. that was as broad as possible to minimise the amount of unnecessary ma enforcement matters having to go through a judicial process where fixed penalty notices could be used? Uh, Sorry, is that? Yeah, the, you're quite correct. The bill gives that breadth and flexibility to introduce okay. that uh, legislation. That that uh, wouldn't necessarily be enshrined in the uh, bill, but uh, supplementary uh, legislation uh, could come from that. Yeah, that's helpful because I thought from the initial comments that maybe some things wouldn't be covered by fixed penalty notices. But that that's that's it's my misunderstanding. I think I just want to be clear on that. So you're not <coughs> suggesting that you, th you think something won't be covered by a fixed penalty notice because this would be a good opportunity to put that on the record if you think there's a gap there in relation to the, use of the, the future use of fixed penalty notices? Mm -hmm. Nothing? OK. Well, yeah. can I ask about food labelling then, convener? Is that OK? Good evening. Sorry. David Martin, okay. he was going yeah. to respond to some of your early stuff, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a of response course, yeah. in the debate, because I think we heard some evidence about how seriously the courts were taking some of these, yeah. and a lot of the issues that could be resolved by fixed penalty is actually will be a penalty, whereas a lot of previous uh, issues were fallen by default because the expense, the length of time, and indeed how seriously the courts took them. So it seems to be on balance, you know, everybody supports it. Mr Martin. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think from our perspective, obviously, we're looking at the fixed penalty notices from a different direction, so we're the regulated rather than the regulator. Um, and from our perspective, I suppose, we're a little bit more sceptical about fixed penalty notices. We do understand... Uh, some of the rationale about um, trying to make um, you know, justice more expedient and uh, cost-effective, etc. But there are just some, if we are to pursue that sort of line, I think that we would be quite keen to see that some uh, sort of safeguards were built in around this, because from our perspective and, and through our members' experiences, we often find that FPNs can often just lead to a tick box approach to enforcement. It doesn't really drive, in our experience, it doesn't really drive um, sort of uh, better performance or indeed compliance. Um, it deters retailers from coming forward for advice because they're obviously worried that there's more penalties for sort of minor infringements. It makes it easier basically uh, to, to, to place down a penalty. There's an issue, I suppose, here as well around. Um, the burden of proof, uh, and I do note that in the, the explanatory notes that uh, future regulation will look at whether it will be beyond reasonable doubt or not, and obviously we would support that. But I think moving into um, FBNs, for us, it does somewhat lower the bar and it makes, it, it makes businesses more hesitant about coming forward for that advice, for speaking to the enforcement agencies about compliance, etc., because it's, it's much easier to have something slapped on you for what is effectively a minor infringement. Um, and also, from an unscrupulous retailer's perspective, um, I suppose, for some, it's seen as just the cost of doing business. It doesn't really have the same, necessarily, um, the same impact of, uh, you know, a, being taken to court and, 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 and pursuing a, a sort of criminal uh, offence. So that is why, obviously, in our written submission, uh, we had suggested that one of the things that we would like to see around the food regulation and in light of the FPNs is an acknowledgement of uh, a lot of this being brought into scope of primary authority. And that obviously deals with a lot of uh, what's been raised earlier by Tony. And I know that previous witnesses to the committee have also uh, given evidence on, on the advantages that they see of that. Obviously, last year, the Scottish Government introduced this through the Regulatory Reform Bill, and we thought this was incredibly, uh, a very uh, admirable move. Uh, we supported it very much, and we've been working with the Scottish Government on this to, to cover a whole range of areas. But I think in terms of food regulation, this is an area where it is most pertinent. And I think for us, it would provide that assurance. It would provide that safeguard that if we were to move to uh, you know, having... Um, 
sort of more infringements being dealt with by FPNs, it would provide that sort of that safeguard for us that obviously we had the due diligence, um, we could seek the advice without necessarily the punishment, that we had that dialogue with the enforcement agency, etc. So for us, um, I suppose, um, you know, if, if the FPN approach is to be pursued for us, we'd like to see that going hand in hand with a lot of this being brought into scope of uh, primary authority. I would just note quickly on, on the labelling issue which links into the FPN point is there is already a group in England set up by the BRDO with retailers looking at how PA primary authority will deal with the FIR when it comes into force next year. And obviously this is a very complicated piece of regulation which will change uh, a lot of uh, the, the, the law around labelling, uh, and to be honest, um, the, the, the interpretation of that, that regulation is still very unclear, both from the regulated but also from the regulator's perspective. So it's good to have that sort of you know, mechanism through which we can use, that we can come to an agreed understanding of what is required, um, because ultimately nobody here is wanting to, to break the law, they want to stay on the right side but they want to know that the safeguards are there, that they can do this. Okay, can I have, a, first of all, uh, just to sweep up on the fixed penalty, that can we have some response to, um, to the, um, the view of the, um, the, the retailers in this? Colin? I understand Mr Martin's point of view from his member's perspective, and I take that on board. Uh, I'd like to maybe reassure him in terms of the environmental health ethos is to provide advice, support and guidance to businesses with the ultimate aim of achieving compliance. Um, they're in there to help them. Enforcement is rarely the first resort. It's mainly the last resort. Mm. Um, it's always done to protect uh, public safety. And this, people spend an awful lot of time helping businesses. We'd much rather see compliant businesses, successful businesses, contributing to the local economy. And it's only when there are people who are uh, minded not to comply or minded to be obstructive and, and it's at the end of a particular process when these sanctions are actually applied. It's not really at the start. So that's, it's just to offer a bit of uh, comfort and advice. Uh, so it's on the, yeah. David, I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's any other views and then you can sure. respond to them. Mr McCauley. I would echo what uh, Colin said. The, the, the ethos of trade standards as well, and, and councils now, we're more f focused in terms of our single outcome agreement with the Scottish Government, in terms of our individual service plans and business plans, and being very business friendly and business support orientated to drive up compliance through advice, through support. We understand that with the complexity of trading standards and environmental health law, businesses are more focused on their, their own operation than looking at, in terms of trading standards, we enforce something like 1,200 different acts and regulations. So we understand the complexities for business. So we do offer that mechanism to support and advise them to drive up compliance. And as, as Mr Wall has said, it is a last resort uh, prosecution and re reports to the fiscal. But there will be habitual offenders. Um, there are very, very small negligible percent, but there, are ne but there are persistent offenders who will break the law with impunity or try to break the law with impunity. But it's about driving up compliance through supporting business, making businesses successful and thriving at a local level. Uh, and I think our ethos previously, when we, in terms of trading standards, we are called consumer protection, which was a name I never, never liked. We were, we were very much enforcers, and the first enforcement was written reports to the fiscal. We've now stepped back from that, and I've now taken a more light touch and enforcement approach. And yes, I would echo Mr Wallace's point about, yeah, we're there to advise business and support them, as opposed to the hammer to crack a nut. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it is necessary. In terms of the reports, and, you know, so it's maybe I've taken this out of previous, you know, reports <coughs> to the fiscal or prosecutions. <coughs> is that a consequence of taking a lighter approach or, or a realistic um, uh, point of view that to take to make reports to fiscals or to pursue prosecutions was very time-consuming, mm -hmm. expensive, and the un uh, and uncertain in its outcome. And that has, the, you know, so, that, I mean, the fixed penalty in there, mm -hmm. Mr. Mark, is, is to be used. Yes. You know, so how many, you know, we, we, we've reduced the number 
I presume, of reports to the fiscal and the prosecutions. Mm -hmm. How many fixed penalties would you expect to issue? Has there been any calculation of that? Have, in the analysis of the use of fixed penalties, what, what makes it uh, an enforcement tool? What, what, what creates a deterrent? Is the, 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 the awareness that you're, be, you're prepared to use it and indeed the level, and then a year later, politicians start asking why you're not using the fixed penalties, and <laughs> you know. So, well, if we could come back and give to give you an example yes. on the on the uh, underage sales of tobacco. Now, trading standards have got the the power to issue a fixed penalty notice where mm -hmm. a trader sells uh -huh. cigarettes to someone under under eighteen, um, and it's a an escalator. So if the first fixed penalty is, and again, it's my staff that get involved in it rather than me, so I'm not really, it's, say, £200. If there's a second offence, yeah. it's £400. If there's a third offence, it's an escalator. It could be 600 But on the third offence, we could then apply for a banning order to a sheriff mm. that that person would uh, be banned from selling tobacco products for a period of time set by the sheriff. So there are these incremental penalties. Um, so if some, again, mistakes, some mistakes do happen. So if someone does sell cigarettes in the first instance they're given a fixed penalty, then hopefully that conduct would then be driven up to compliance because of that fixed penalty incident. And it's only then that the habitual trader, which there are some, will then break the law because of the financial aspect that He's mo making more money selling to underage mm -hmm. school children than he is in paying fixed penalty notices. So there is an escalator there yep. to, to hopefully assist with driving up compliance. Um, I don't have the figures here. No, in no, that no, I think that th these are good examples, Mr. Martin. That's, that's perfectly reasonable. Isn't it? Repeat offenders, warnings, help, assistance, make them aware, and an incremental approach for, to punish those people who, who are just ignoring the law. Is that to, not reasonable? To some degree, but I, I guess the point here is, um, I would, I mean, I would posit that the the challenge for a trading standards officer to take a retailer to court over something compared to putting a fixed penalty notice on the retailer for something. There is a difference there in terms of the, the burden of proof, but also um, just how expedient that is to do. And fine, if we're going to go down an FPN route, we can accept some of the arguments around the expedience of that, but we want to make sure that they are handed out fairly and proportionately, and that there is a, you know, there is an ability to to some degree, as there would be through court, to challenge some of these decisions. I mean, at the end of the day, we have 32 local authorities, and sometimes, I regret to say, they take 32 different decisions or interpret things differently. And so, from our perspective, when it comes to you know, national uh, regulatory approach, we don't want to see that regulation being interpreted in different ways. Um, but, you know, everyone is human, that's what happens. So, we have to have the mechanisms built in place to ensure that where there is a difference of opinion, for example, there is that check, there is that safeguard that you don't just accept the fixed penalty notice because, frankly, that trading standards officer or that environmental or health officer has decided that that's their, that, that's their local authority interpretation of, for example, what should be on a label or what shouldn't be on a label. And as I've already mentioned with regards to the FIR, there's, there's still not really agreement yet between uh, both obviously the, the, the enforcer and between the regulated around actually what a lot of this will mean. And the fact is a lot of the regulation around food is incredibly complicated. And I wouldn't say it's a criticism. Uh, it, certainly, it certainly isn't a criticism of trading standards officers, environmental health officers. You know, I am positive and what our members tell us is they do discharge their duties um, you know, in a, a very good way in Scotland, actually. But things do slip through the nets. People do interpret legislation differently. People don't all necessarily, businesses and the regulator, don't often read the same piece of regulation in the same way. So you just want to make sure, before it gets to the point of an FPN, that you're on the same page. And that's where the primary authority kicks in. Um, previously, if it was you were taken to court, then you could prove, well, actually, this is our interpretation, that's their interpretation, let's fight this out um, and see who's actually got the right interpretation. But if we are just handing out FPNs, there's not that ability to challenge. I suppose the last point there I'd like to make is, you know, the reason the Scottish Government brought this in last year is because, as my members have told them and as businesses that operate throughout the UK have told them, frankly, 
when it comes to this sort of issue, the regulatory environment in England and Wales is better. And it's better because we have a closer working relationship with the local authorities and trading standards, environmental, well, and not in the case of England. And we have that sort of safeguard and businesses are a lot clearer. We have the due diligence, we have the advice, we have the assured guidance that we don't have in Scotland. Um, the final point I suppose I'd make also on, on the FPN is if we are going to issue FPNs, our plea would be that they would be issued not just to the store or the store manager, but they're also given to the HQ because business, you know, our members want to know if a store is being perceived as not being compliant. And if it's just handed to a store, then obviously that, that chain of command might not uh, feed that all the way up to the top. Well, I'm afraid I, I can't agree with Mr Martin at all there <coughs> uh, in a lot of what he said. I don't know whether the committee are aware of the Scottish Food in, uh, Enforcement Liaison Committee, um, acronym SFELC, which comprises enforcers, <coughs> trade, Scottish government, um, uh, trade, uh, trade bodies, Scot Scottish food and drink, so on and so forth. It's a multi-agency uh, body that have met regularly for a number of years. Uh, it goes back to previous administrations and pre previous incantations. It provides excellent, consistent advice to enforcers across Scotland. They provide training uh, advice, they provide uh, matrices for qualifications, uh, guides as to how industries should comply, guides to how enforcers should uh, apply re uh, legislation. So it's actually the model which is envied by England and Wales. And the benefit of Scotland is the fact that we've got 32 authorities who can all get together very regularly in the one room. And it works really, really well. So I feel that we're more than adequately covered in that regard. Just a very quick point in relation to the, the fixed penalty issue. The current code of practice for food visits means that if an officer finds a contravention, they notify the food business operator. The next time they go back, if that the contravention is still there, it's repeated, they've got to escalate that. Now, the, you're then looking, maybe in two or three visits, serving an improvement notice. And it, that's ridiculous, really, to have to do something like that over a repeat contravention. Um, and again, it's the time that you, you mentioned, convener, about having to do reports, uh, having to get to court, etc., etc. So, uh, a fixed penalty notice in regards to a repeat contravention would be a means of actually dealing with this and not having it to go any further. I think we've had, we've given, I'm going to move on, Richard, with, with, with the labelling, because I think we've had, uh, given the fixed penalty and the issues there. I think there's a quite a good balance, but I'll get you in later on. But, Bob, you, 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 we don't need to resolve the issue. We will resolve that in the evidence that we have, obviously. But the, the other aspects here that have been mentioned, Bob, are the labelling and FIR and the, current, the legislation that's working its way through. I think I'll, I'll try and be, be brief in, in relation to this, because some of it was mopped up, mopped up a little bit there. And evidence. It's just to be clear, I've asked this at each evidence session. It, it, it does seem bizarre to myself that just now the courts have the power to, officers of the power to seize and courts have the power to uh, destroy or dispose of unsafe food, but not of fraudulent food. So if it's uh, claimed to be lamb and it's beef you have or whatever, technically just now there's not the power for the courts to, to, to seize and destroy that. It will become the case that, that, that that can happen now. My understanding, I don't know where I get the understanding from, I'm happy for witnesses to tell me what they think, that um, the, the policy intent of the bill is not to look at m m minor labelling infringements, but fairly blatant food fraud within the food chain and, at, at, and within the retail sector. So are witnesses content that officers should have the power to seize and courts should have the power, if need, need be, to destroy Fraudulent food, for example, it seems bizarre to myself that trading standards, for example, could um, uh, seize, if you like, um, trainers that were, say, not Adidas, uh, you know, Adidas or Nike, seize and destroy them. But when it's when it's food, they don't have that power. So does that redress that balance? Have they done it in a, a commensurate yes. and measured way? Um, and more importantly, I suppose, I think it's the right thing to do anyway, but is there any evidence of where food fraud's been identified that that, that that has continued within the food chain because the powers aren't there? So, yes, I think it's the right thing to do, do people agree, but actually, how, to what extent do you believe there is actually a problem, I suppose? OK. Archie Anderson wants to um, respond. We condemn food because it's unfit for human consumption. And no one, I think, has any objection to that whatsoever. 
But to condemn food that's fit for human consumption would seem to be ridiculous. I mean, OK, someone's committing a fraud by selling lamb as pork or pork as lamb. But to take the analogy you're suggesting of the trainers, when people are seized trainers, often they then send these trainers to charities. Now, there's no reason to condemn a fraud of food by selling it under a different name. It's not a fraud of food. It's not a, it's not a condemnable thing. That food should be then given to charities and used there. But for heaven's sake, don't condemn good food. I just, I think you make a reasonable point. So destroy, seize, direct elsewhere. However, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is whether it's put back in to the same food chain and supply oh, and no. retail for Take the offence to be perpetuated rather than seized by the courts and redeployed yeah. elsewhere. But I think that point's well made. I think, yeah. Do you want to come back on that again? Or you know, yeah. Does anyone else say, you know, sort of... Yeah. Yes, David Martin. Um, I think a, a couple of points I would make about this is, I mean, our, our interpretation uh, which um, o, o, of the way the bill is drafted right now is that without uh, the necessary appropriate controls, uh, we could end up with some pretty disproportionate enforcement action. Um, and I think if we take that to its logical conclusion, that's not to say that I don't necessarily agree with the principle of what you're trying to say. But I think we have to make sure that what we've got in the bill actually doesn't result in some pretty calamitous outcomes, which is what our reading of this bill could uh, end up doing. Um, I completely agree with, with Archie on the point that if a food is not condemnable, um, and for example, there might be a degree here about proportionality around, around this provision, and also the consistency of interpretation of things like on labelling, which is very, very complicated. What we would like to see here is a sort of two-stage um, approach built into this. So the first is that there should be a right to challenge the decision on whether the food should be sort of seized and destroyed and removed, and that should be um, that the food shouldn't just be taken and destroyed, and then you can appeal the decision, and then you can have the sort of you know the monetary value made up. Because actually, you know, we've got some really important things um, at risk here. We've got consumer confidence uh, and how that is dented with regards to a product withdrawal. We've also got the supplier and the producer. So, in our case, if we are forced to withdraw a product, let's say it's a you know, a small uh, Scottish producer from the borders, and we're forced to withdraw that product on a misdemeanour on a label, then there's no guarantee that that slot will then be filled again by that small indigenous Scottish producer. It will be filled very quickly with something else. So it's damage to the producer as well as to the consumer confidence. And of course, there's damage to the retailer for something that might be deemed as, uh, you know, disproportionate. So it's not where it is an issue of food safety, we're very clear on that. There's regulation that deals with that. There's no question it has to be removed straight away, immediately. Um, even in the case of horse meat, where it wasn't an issue of food safety, but there was an issue there of consumer confidence. You know, my members removed the product absolutely immediately. There was no question. It all came off the shelves. Um, but if it is an issue where it's not about safety, if it is an issue about labelling, we have an issue here about proportionality, about is it just the case of you know, a misspelt label or an ingredient wrong or is, um, you know, is it a, the, 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 the product misbranded or something around that? Because this is all, this, this is all, this would all be, this could also be considered. There's also the issue about the consistency. Is our interpretation of the labelling regulations the same as the enforcer's um, interpretation? We need to, we, so, it might not be, so we need that ability to appeal. And again, I would say this is another area, because it will be governed from April with FIR, that we can bring this under a primary authority so we can have those checks and balances. I think it's important that uh, the legislation targets the right person. I think to some extent the retailer is a soft target because he's there and he's available. Uh, but as we know from the, uh, the incident of the horsemeat scandal, uh, that substitution of beef with horse meat occurred further down the chain when you look at the ready meals or the burgers and it wasn't actually committed in the UK. It was in Ireland with the burgers, it was in France with the background in the Netherlands, so it was a complicated uh, international food fraud. Uh, and I think it's important that in our efforts to move forward in this and promote the integrity of Scottish food, 
that we're making sure that the supply chain, that we're in at all levels of the supply chain. So the work that Quality Meat Scotland does, we're doing the work on farms and in abattoirs to underpin the integrity of our brands. But actually there's a gap there uh, which we're started, we've now started to look at since horse meat in terms of integrity of further manufacturers and what they're doing with products and how they're doing it and the, the audits that are required there. So I guess I'm, I'm just suggesting that the committee should consider uh, that we're targeting the right people here uh, in terms of who's actually committing the fraud. And I think it's also important that the penalties are proportionate to the amount of gain that the perpetrator uh, has had. So there must be some link with turnover or the degree of profit that that person has had. For example, uh, horse meat costs 70 pence a kilo and beef at that time was about £3.20 a kilo. It has since gone up to £4 a kilo. So you can see the, what the adulteration factor of 25% can do in terms of generating additional margin. And it's, uh, it's, it's the people, the unscrupulous people uh, further back in the chain that we need to target the regulation up. Is, well. the, is the bill in its current form sufficient to assist you in that aim? Does it make the difference you would want it to make to get that focus? I suppose it's the bill that we're looking at here. Does the bill do the job uh, to, 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 to help you ensure um, uh, the outcome that you would want? Well, I've read the bill and uh, I don't feel I'm qualified to actually give you an answer on that because I'm not a lawyer. All I would say is I, I would push that back uh, and say we need to make sure that the bill can achieve that aim. But how, um, how do we make sure the bill achieves that aim? What does it need to say? What do, you know, in, not in legal, legal jargon, but in general? Well, you need to be able to uh, get further back in the chain. It, I guess the point I'm making is it's not necessarily the retailer. He's the guy that's sitting there with the product on a shelf, but if he's been duped, by the unscrupulous operator mm. further back in the chain, somewhere between the primary producer and the person who puts uh, the, the product on the shelf. That's the area that we need to make sure that we've got uh, scope within this legislation to dig into and root out the habitual offenders. And it's probably the same people that aren't paying their tax returns. Y you know, people who cheat, cheat across a wide range of areas. And we need to be working across government to identify where some of these, using intelligence across government, to identify where some of these operators are. Yeah. I've got a couple of comments. Did you want in, Colin? Just very quickly to say that this isn't an option that would be used that often, I don't think. In other words, the detention issue is to detain food for further investigation to get more information in regard to uh, what's wrong and the implications. And also, there are certain compliance measures that some of the food business operators could take in terms of things like re wrapping or relabeling or reprocessing, which would achieve the compliance. So it would be not inappropriate. You wouldn't need to use that uh, tool in that case. All I'm saying is it's not as if this is going to be happening every day and enforcers are going to be into businesses and uh, issuing seizure and detention notices willy-nilly. It's only where the mechanism as currently exists can't actually resolve the issue and there's concerns about potential food safety issues linked to the food standards issues. David? Um, I mean, I suppose my perspective is what do we want to do here with the labelling provisions? So um, there is an issue of food safety, so if it's an allergen problem and the label's incorrect, but then that would be food safety, that wouldn't be um, a fraudulent label. The other thing is, is it just a you know incorrect label? Is there something on it that's misspelled? Is there something on it that shouldn't that's been included that shouldn't have been included? And that's a different matter. And then finally, there's the issue of food fraud. And I don't think that um, fraud you know fraud is a criminal activity. This labelling provisions is not going to stop criminal activity. Yule is absolutely correct. This is a supply chain issue. Uh, you need to get it much earlier on in, in the supply chain. In the case in the case of horse meat. You know, our members, you know, and that's not to, you know, this is not at all to, to, bel to belittle the seriousness of, of horse meat. My members took that incredibly serious. This was a very serious issue. But at the end of the day, these were retailers who went to their suppliers, who gave them a schematic and asked them to give them a product, label that product, and they would sell that product. What they asked for often was British beef, and what they got was neither British nor beef. And a lot of this stemmed 
as you have said, from complex um, you know, uh, supply chains that were out with the UK. That's why, since horse meat, our members have had to be have upped their, uh, um, the amount of random testing, auditing, sharing intelligence. There's a working group being set up under the FSA where they now, with other industry groups, pool intelligence to target the testing at at-risk products and at supply chains. There's more auditing of supply chains, including suppliers to suppliers, and there's also more unannounced audits on suppliers, much to the consternation of some of the suppliers. So a lot of things are happening to try and root out fraud, but it has to be, tar it has to be targeted and it has to be uh, you know, it has to be evidence-based. At the end of the day, in the case of horse meat, we tested over around 10,000 products. Of those products, 0.1% revealed evidence of horse meat above the 1% threshold. So that was 99% clear. That's not, again, I'm not, that's not a statistic to, to belittle the seriousness of the incident, but rather to say it shows how targeted we have to be in order to root out this fraud. So we need to deal with the supply chain. It's about evidence sharing. It's about approaching things from a risk-based approach. It's about making sure we get our resources in the right place. Is a label going to change all of that? I don't think it is. I mean, if you can defraud a product, you can defraud a label. Job done. You know, how, how are you, you know, are you all working together, as he suggested, and sharing that information? You all, you, you, you I, I and then a, Mr Macaulay. There is a lot of uh, working together happening uh, right across the industry, across supply chains. We need, we need to increase that. I guess I would say that the retailer has a responsibility, though. So when retailers adopt a global sourcing policy and they're driving what they would say as costs out of the system, uh, and you know, taking tenders for product, uh, this this price competitiveness in UK retailers is really uh, the driver for why sometimes there's a race to the bottom, and quality can get compromised. And that was the driver in the horse meat scandal because there was someone out there who could supply a product at a cheaper price, so you could get ten burgers for eighty pence or whatever it was. And the driver was that cost. And OK, we know all retailers have a, a premium offer and a standard offer and a value offer. But re really, we have to, you know, the retailer also, to, also has to ensure that his supply chains have that integrity that's necessary. Mr Macaulay. Um, I'm not particularly qualified to speak on food issues, but I suppose in the general kind of fraud environment that we work within in trade and standards, the horse meat, for, for instance, was an international fraud. It was uh, serious and organised criminals that were actually involved in this um, uh, exercise. And if that's the people who are involved in it, they're going to seek an advantage where they can. Um, and it is about traceability. It is about being more intelligence-led and being able to pass intelligence between agencies to actually stop these frauds from happening. And that be it European agencies, international agencies, and our own agencies in the UK, so that that intelligence is passed to identify food fraud. But I, as I say, food isn't my locus, so I'm, I'm not qualified to, to speak on that. It's just, you know, I mean, I, I think everybody would accept in hospital yeah. camp that this bill is not going to deal with that. But, you know, uh, with, mm -hmm. with the good intent of the Scottish Government to bring for you, you can't, after a horsemeat scandal, not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, have that in your thoughts as you're bringing what to try and protect the quality of the brand, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But we've heard in evidence that it's much more common. To, you know, food fraud is, is is a sexy title, but you know, it's a cod or haddock. You know, you know. So uh, there's a perspective due here, and I suppose that that's where this bill uh, comes in. It's not all international mm -hmm. fraud. It is about cod and haddock in some cases, or lamb or beef, or what's in your curry on a Friday night, you know, and it, you know, so can this bill tackle these issues? Have I got anybody? Are we, no? I suppose you don't want to speak about a bill and, and, and not talk about horse meat rather than <laughs> cod or haddock, you know, nobody wants to. Yes, I, David, I, I, I'm, provoke someone. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, I think you know, if if we're wanting to if we're wanting to solve an issue, whether it's cod or haddock, then having um, 
you know, provisions around um, the threat of being able to withdraw a product on the basis of labelling is not going to stop the cod or haddock issue. It will, it's a reaction after the event. You need to deal with it much earlier on in the supply chain, and we need to be sure that there's the integrity in the supply chain, and that when, for example, if it's a, a product that contains, for example, it's not just the fish, but it contains um, elements of that fish, that when you give that specification as a retailer to the supplier, that is exactly what you are getting in return. Now, there is an onus, and Yul is absolutely right, there is an onus on the retailers to make sure, uh, and one thing that Horsemeat has done is to make sure that, you know, there is a, a, a bigger pressure now on retailers, not just to make sure that they are satisfied with the way that they are retailing the product, but they are satisfied with their supply chain all the way right to the very end. And the only way we're going to do that and through a lot of the measures we're already doing, which is targeting our testing, sharing our intelligence, obviously auditing our supply chains more often, retaking the complexity out of the supply chains, because that was an issue around horse meat, it's shortening them, um, doing things like unannounced audits on suppliers. Um, you know, they don't like that, dries up their costs, but it secures our supply chains. So these are the sort of steps. But frankly, the bill doesn't deal with any of that. The, the bill deals with labelling. We, we recently have a fish processor, and they, they say that they are highly audited, at least by the, the, the local environmental pe people, but by, by the supermarkets constantly. But their issue with labelling, and their worry about labelling, given that they sell into a bigger, you know, sort of bigger UK market, is that if labelling requirements became... Um, uh, more prescriptive here in Scotland, that 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 would that would give them uh, maybe a you know a difficult job to 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 uh, you to you know in costs and and deal with uh, uh, with the big supermarkets. I don't know whether anyone wants to reflect in that balance from the manufacturer's point of view and evidence that we've had. Colin Wallace. I don't think it's particularly that. In a sense, it's it's about misleading the consumer. I think what we're requiring and we would like to see is accurate labels so that the consumer can make their own mind up in terms of what they're buying. And they shouldn't be misled. Chair, you mentioned there about Haddock, Coddock, uh, Haddock uh, Whiting, um, Cod. People should get what they ask for. Then there's uh -huh. also the issue in terms of meat substitution, which can have a, a grave effect in certain uh, religious sectors, you know, who you know, would be outraged yes. if they're reading something that they thought was something else. Yes. Um, so it's a case of misleading. Very often misleading happens by accident, but sometimes it happens by design. And I think um, it's about the appropriate of, uh, touch and the proportionality and how we actually deal with it. And I feel that the, the bill sets out the provisions to be able to deal with all these issues. There is an ambition, though, about health, nutrition, and from a health committee's point of view, does this give us an opportunity to create a more healthier lifestyle in Scotland and, you know, and, and, you know, promote healthy eating, deal with some of the obesity issues, which could come into that sphere as well? Very much so. I mean, that's something that we, we uh, in Rehas are very keen to do. Uh, at the moment, it's all about compliance, uh, and clearly you have to actually take this forward slowly, but we do a lot of work with our communities in relation to uh, food and health courses. Uh, tell, we've got a, a course just now that we do, which is elementary cooking skills. Now, that might sound bizarre, but it's amazing the number of people and young, uh, youngsters in schools and so forth who don't know how to cook. A lot of their parents aren't aware of how to cook things properly. The nutritious way to uh, cook food, the way like some my mum used to do it and taught me and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, uh, potential good work to be done there, uh, preventative work for the future. Okay. Richard Lyle. Thank you, convener. Um, basically, I think uh, most of the questions that I was going to ask have already have been um, asked, but I was quite interested in Mr Morton's uh, point and also Mr Martin's point. Uh, last week I actually divulged that I was a grocer for nearly 20 years, so with the greatest respect to you, Mr Martin, I don't agree with your points in regards to uh, environmental health officer. I always found them quite uh, amiable, quite uh, reasonable, and tried to help before they come along and, uh, uh, as you would suggest, stuck the boot in. Um, so basically I would suggest that they, they are uh, um, quite reasonable guys. So can I now turn to the question that I, I, I can ask? Uh, the point in regards to the size of the board, um, 
I think there were various proposals made. Three is too, uh, is too little uh, with a chairman. So can I ask the members round and uh, how many people should be on the board and also uh, who you would suggest would be the type of people you would like on the board? Certainly in our submission we, we suggested that three was too small uh, in addition to the chairman and uh, we feel it's important that uh, the balance is struck be between having uh, a broad representation on the board of people who know the industry and how the industry works and we, we would say that you know FSA at the moment doesn't, doesn't achieve that in the FSA national board because they, they don't appoint industry people because they're, they say they're conflicted. Uh, I would take the opposite view that you, you need to get that balance between uh, people who are independent, so you've got some independent members on the board and you have some people who have uh, detailed industry knowledge of how supply chains work. Uh, I think it's also important that you get that balance between having enough people to reach a consensual decision on any aspect under discussion, but not having too many people that the committee's unwieldy or too expensive to service. Uh, so it's getting that figure uh, between, I don't know, 8 and 12 people might be the figure if you asked me as a layman to give you a view on that. Anyone else? David. Martin. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily put a, a number on it. I think there's just some principles. So the, the first is that the board has got to obviously be uh, fully independent and free of any special interests, whether that is industry or public health or anyone else, obviously, with, a, with an axe to grind. And on that basis, I would say that I would preclude the retail sector from the board or industry from the board personally. Um, I mean, it's, as long as there are people around the table, the relevant expertise and understanding of the sectors with which they're dealing um, I think that that would be satisfactory and that stops any sort of uh, special interest uh, bias around that. Um, I suppose the last point I'd make about that is that's something I feel that um, the Scudamore Review didn't manage to achieve actually. It didn't have that expertise there that could deal with retail and could actually deal with anyone beyond the farm gate. So I think from our perspective, um, the board needs to be truly independent, free from being captured from special interests on the outside, pressure from the outside, but also on the inside it has to be free of that, um, which is why I think that as long as there's the relevant expertise, there's the industry knowledge, I wouldn't necessarily suggest there should be actually people from industry on the table, around the table. Archie Anderson. I'd like to one particular special specialist group on the board, and that is the consumer. The consumer should be represented on the board. I mean, really, that's the that's the person, that's the end pro that's the person, the end product. They're going to eat the stuff and, and have the stuff. They should be represented fully. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, please. Well, I would just uh, come back to David's point, where I'd say one man's bias is another man's detailed insight into a particular situation. Yeah. As a, yes, Colin Wallace. Just one final point. Just to, I think the balance is correct, and it's obviously the skills, the skill set that required of board members will be specified in other areas. Um, but uh, in terms of public health, uh, I think maybe Mr. Martin meant that you, you didn't think somebody from a sector or sector of public health should be on it. But to me, the bill is all about public health. It's about improving the, public, the, the health of the public and providing the consumer with confidence and safety. And that should be the overarching aspect for any board member, and I'm sure it would be, because I'm sure it's the same for yourself. Mr Martin, can you tell us what you said? Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean that public health shouldn't be represented. I just mean, for example, uh, those who lobby on behalf of public health interests. So lobbying organisations or other organisations that would perhaps be the equivalent of the SRC, but on the public health side. So absolutely, uh, there should be a public health input there, if that's absolutely right, but not necessarily people who have a slightly more political agenda around public health. Yeah. I think we've heard quite a lot of evidence about pooling resources as well, and, and uh, the, the, the widest possible resources in, in respect to research and, uh, uh, and food study and drawing in all of the information we need to be more proactive rather than end up in prosecutions, but actually, you know, have an influence, uh, a sort of bigger influence through research and knowledge. Uh, you, you know, the, the, uh, I presume that people 
uh, I am presuming, but maybe not, but that, that, um, that that's something that is to be valued and should continue. No? I, I wasn't asking your opinion, Richard. I was trying to elicit well, some opinion I, from I the... I thought I would come back in my question. I will let you in. If, thank if you. Thank is, you. If thank there's you. no... As I always do. Uh, and maybe, was, maybe sitting up here, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing enough. Um, but no, basically... Richard, I'm trying to get, elicit some response yeah. from the, the panellists. If they've not got any response, then, then, then that's fine. But Yes, just, Colin Wallace. Just one thing. It, it, you asked earlier on, did we feel we had sufficient collaborative working arrangements to actually look at all the various information, the intelligence, and put it together? And I mentioned earlier on the Scottish Food Enforcement Liaison Committee. Just, I'll run through very much who's on the thing. Um, Society of Chief Officers of Environmental Health, local, local Food Liaison Group Reps, Association of Public Analysts, the Scottish Micro Microbiological Group, Health Protection Scotland, Society for Chief Officers of Trade and Standards, Consumer Focus Scotland, REHIS, COSLA, Food Standards Agency in Scotland, British Hospitality Association, Scottish and Food and Drink Federation, Scottish Retail Consortium are, are, are invited to come along, Consultant and Public Health Medicine Group, Scottish Food Advisory Committee, National Farmers Union Scotland, the Scottish Government Rural Payments and Inspections, Inspections Directorate. So it gives you an idea of how broad it is. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of information coming yep. in and a lot of consultation going out there as to you know what should and shouldn't happen. So I believe that we've got the the building blocks to continue to take this forward. Yeah. My question was, I'd like to communicate what I was saying. What, what is your influence in terms of uh, the development of, of, of research, do you get any influence in how, how that comes about, about the issues that are pertinent to Scotland? You know, we've heard the evidence that E. coli strain, what is it? Is Richard, can you help? 57 or 107 or whatever. There, 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 are, there are particular problems uh, in, in, uh, in this field that, you know, are, will this give us a better opportunity to focus, um, you know, some of that expertise with outcomes in terms of research to actually get to the heart of some of, some of these some of these issues, David Martin. I think before I answer that question, question if I may, the, the, the only the only sort of uh, rebuttal I would offer uh, to that, that that previous point about the, the, the committee and the group is that the committee and the group can't um, hand out assured guidance, which is statutory backed, which is if you follow and do you obey, then therefore you know you're within the confines of the law and you have nothing to worry about in terms of enforcement action if you've behaved yourself. Um, around um, the resources, we, as we've put in our written submission, did have some concerns around whether um, effectively if you have one body doing everything across a single market, which is effectively what the UK is, a very integrated UK market, particularly from our perspective, uh, our members are probably the lion's share, if not the only export market for Scottish producers throughout the rest of the UK. So it's very integrated. Um, if you have if you have a setup like that and you have one body dealing with this and then you move to two, then there are questions, automatic questions about are resources going to be denuded, is expertise going to be denuded, etc. Having seen previous um, witnesses giving evidence and having discussed this with the Scottish Government, we are aware there's going to be memorandums of understanding, there's going to be protocols around this. I suppose our perspective is that that's all fine, uh, but we would probably appreciate a lot more detail on that uh, now rather than let's pass the bill and let's hope that all of this falls into place later because, frankly, this is an area that is far, far too important um, for us to take a chance on. We have to be absolutely sure that once the body set up that we have exactly the same resources, not a penny less, going to everything that we want it to go to, that we have consistent advice, we have coordinated advice and we have the necessary access to the access and influence to the appropriate um, advisory committees. So I guess our perspective is there is an element of taking this on faith. We are slightly sceptical, but um, we'd hope that at the end of this process that we have a very clear and transparent approach of how this is all going to, this is all going to work. Uh, around the public health issue here, because obviously that's an additional piece of scope that this, is, this, this body might be asked to, to deal with, I suppose our point is anything that is additional for the body to deal with, it should be properly resourced. Um, you might be aware that the, retail that the retail sector over the last three, three years has provided £95 million to the Scottish Government in the form of a public health supplement. That was for public health. That would be the sort of ideal funding source that could fund uh, action on obesity, on public health. 
we are uh, still clueless about how obviously that funding has been used to support public health, but um, I would suggest that and there's, you know, there's, there's no clear uh, audit trail on how that money has been used, but there is money there that's coming in from us again this year, uh, which specifically targeted for public health. So there is, there is money there for uh, dealing with obesity. Anyone else? Bill, please. I would just like to make a point about, you know, we've obviously discussed a lot about uh, food safety and labelling yeah. and the enforcement thereof. And I think one of the areas is that the, the, the new body needs to, wants to cover is the improvement to the national diet. And we feel that the, uh, the bill as dra currently drafted doesn't provide enough uh, provision for that in terms of how that's going to uh, take place. Uh, David's just mentioned obesity levels in Scotland. Uh, you can add on to that, you, you know, the result of that in terms of heart disease uh, and other health problems that we have. And I know from speaking to ministers that th th there is a desire to create a healthier Scotland, a better Scotland. And, you know, at the moment our citizens are making the wrong choices. Uh, so I'd be interested to see how this committee can influence uh, the bill as it's currently drafted to provide greater scope for uh, the new food body to give us more leads and to do more educational work. Uh, our own organisation, Quality Meat Scotland, does a lot of... I've been there eight years, and every year I've been there, we've done more and more work in schools and with young people. And there's a big desire for more and more information on how to, how to eat a healthy and balanced diet. And uh, we need to really take this seriously and influence the citizens of tomorrow when they're at a stage where they'll take that learning on uh, in the primary school and have that information uh, to put into practice when, when they grow up and raise their own families. And I agree with the earlier comment about cooking and the lack of cooking skills. And we do a lot of work on that, but we're a small body with a very limited budget. Uh, we would like to see uh, how the new food body can really take that on, and we would be delighted to work with them uh, to put our little bit together with their bigger bit and uh, provide some change uh, in this area. Okay. Is there anyone else from the panel want to comment on the public health issues? No. <laughs> Uh, we're coming and then bought, but, but Can I just make a quick Yes, point? certainly. I think we need to make the distinction between what we traditionally realise as public health, which is about safety, and the dietary aspect, mm -hmm. the dietary and nutritional aspects of public health. So when you mention public health to a group of prof professionals, they're on the safety aspect, but it needs to be wider than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think... I, was, I thought I was going to give Richard Lyle the last question. Yeah, but I'm quite happy to take that on board. To Bob Doris wants in. What do you think? Ah, do you want the last question or do you two, want the second last question? Well, two, quest, uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, uh, right, Bob you, can have the last question. Bob can have the last question. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Um, firstly, can I agree with Mr. Morton? Uh, there, there was some inter on labelling. There was quite, an, a, quite a, an interesting meeting I had with Coca-Cola. Did you know that Coca-Cola actually adjusts their formula in every country to meet the the, the local um, uh, requirements, which I, I found quite interesting. So I, I don't know where it is between uh, UK and, and France or, or, or Luxembourg or whatever, but they, they change the formula throughout the world, which is quite interesting. Uh, in regards to the point of uh, who should sit on the board, and uh, I think Mr Martin is quite a sceptic in, in one way, but the situation is I would agree that it should be a, maybe possibly a, a bigger board where uh, I'm sure there are many people out there who have the expertise to come on who won't be uh, your Asda's or your Morrison's or your, even your, your uh, retail consortium. Uh, guys, it will be experts in the field, and I'm sure that would that would be the case. Thank you. Last question to Bob Doris. Right, I'll, yeah, I'll try and fit a question in there. I, I should, of course, first praise uh, Mr. Morton and Mr. Anderson because you're the only two witnesses that's ever said who should be on that board. Everyone else has ducked the question, so thank you very much <laughs> for, for for doing that. In relation, just moving one or two things, the, the, the public health levy is worth putting on record. The reason it was called a public health levy because it, it targeted the largest retailers that sold both alcohol and tobacco, and I think that's important to put on the record as why that was 
that that was targeted. But I, I'm kind of interested. Don't worry, I'm not going to go back to the details of of labelling. Although the reason I had asked the question, convener, was hopefully to give the reassurance that it's not going to be, uh, you know, micro details on labelling. It was more about food fraud, and I think people would would readily assume that if you're if you're paying for lamb and you're getting beef, that's just wrong. That's not a minor infringement on labelling. That's just fraud. Likewise, if you get a deal that's too good to be true for beef and it's horse meat because one seventy p a kilo and one's three eighty a kilo, there's a responsibility on the retailer. And I think that was that line of questioning. And I take on board quite rightly how you have to follow that, not just the retailer, but right through the food chain. And I'm sure the expertise is there to do that. But the question, convener. Okay. I did want to mop some of that up. I thought it was important to provide balance to it. The question, convener, is in relation to how that all fits in with the duty to report. So, you know, if a, if a retailer or whoever within the food chain gets a deal that's just too good to be true and you know it's iffy, you know it's dodgy, I would expect that you, there should be a statutory obligation to raise that with the authorities rather than, that, 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 than not. So there's now a duty to report where they believe there could be infringement. Some, some views on that would be good. But actually, in praise of the retail sector, and I want to know how widespread it is, uh, a representative from Tesco were here the other week, and they said since the horse meat scandal, there's much more transparency in relation to the testing they do and reporting that testing and how they're working now in partnership with food standards experts and the large retailers to have a more risk-based, targeted approach to testing. Because there had been a feeling beforehand that Sometimes you can test to validate what you think is safe or how you build in the risk element and target what is more appropriate to test. So the two aspects to my question, Kavina, in terms of the duty to report, do people see that as being an important part within the bill in relation to everyone uh, meeting their responsibilities? And is there enough been done in relation to transparency of testing of the large retailers? Is that better on a voluntary basis or should we be looking in the future at having that on a statutory basis? It's not really a, a right. brief end question, but Th it does fit yeah, in thanks, well with previous I would, questions. I would ask the panellists, Bob, if you mm -hmm. would agree that we focus on the duty to report and mm -hmm. the inspection regime. Yeah. Qu quick responses, please. Yeah. David Martin, Colin Wallace. Can I just start with Macaulay. the duty? Um, it might just be our reading of yeah. the bill, and therefore we don't, you know, We've maybe slightly misinterpreted this, but I, I'm a bit of a loss as to why, in principle, no problem at all, but a bit of a loss of why this has been included in the bill, given that the FIR will make this a, a provision anyway in April 2015. So for our, from our perspective, we will be legally obliged to report this. I mean, the wording is, food business operators which do not affect food information shall not supply food which they know or presume on the basis of the information in their possession as professionals to be non-compliant with applicable food information law. So we will be compelled from April 2015 next year to do this anyway. So in principle, yes, yeah. but don't understand why it's in the bill. Um, from In terms yeah, of the transparency the perspective, the um, absolutely. Um, Tim Smith from Tesco is absolutely right, and that's replicated across all of our members that transparency is key, though we need to make sure that we get the transparency right. So as I've said, since the horse meat incident, we've uh, tested around 10,000 products. We've shared all of that information publicly, and we've shared it all with the FSA on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. But actually, is the FSA interested in every single one of those 10,000 tests? Probably not. Is that a good use of resource? Probably not. Are we better perhaps sharing trends with the FSA and making that public? Uh, on a targeted basis, that's probably a, an easier way to make the information more relevant and digestible uh, and pertinent for, obviously, enforcement reasons. Thank you. Colin Wallace. Very quickly, yes, uh, they should. Um, a lot of businesses do. They work very closely with environmental health, give us information about areas that they're sceptical about and concerned about because they know we're there to help and provide them with that support and ad ad advice and guidance. And yes, the reason I say they should do it is because uh, there's no reason they can then turn around and say, well, we, didn't, we weren't aware, we didn't think there was anything wrong, we weren't aware about this and uh, we didn't. If they know that it's a duty on them, and that's what we would advise them, um, and insist them in understanding their responsibilities. So that would be yes. In terms of this transparency, yes, I agree with everything that's been said as well. Uh, local authorities, the one area of concern I have is that local authorities have consistently over the last... 10 years possibly, reduced their sampling uh, budget and in terms of savings and that has caused difficulties in relation to properly 
targeting risk-based approaches to um, local and national food sampling areas. So uh, local authorities want to do as much as they can. Uh, ironically, uh, once the horse meat DNA scandal broke, that's when all of a sudden there's a flurry of samples being taken in particular that area. That might well have been brought up or found out earlier had local authorities continued to sampling at the rate they had done previously. But you mentioned, just I know I've been putting pressure on it, but you mentioned earlier that part of your role is to inform and keep up your people informed about legislation. Have you been briefing out the, 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 of, of the responsibility of people in 2015? As, as uh, David Martin has pointed out, this will be the law in 2015. Do people know that? And have you made them aware of that in your role? Well, environmental health personnel will. They will be discussing with uh, the, the, the people they, they meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, environmental health is much wider than just food safety. It's an integral part of that. But when they're dealing with other issues, uh, they're advising people of what may well be. Uh, they can only say that this is on the horizon. Potentially, this is what will happen. Yeah. But I, mean, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't know that I would be, you know, put my hands up and confess, I'm, I'm scrutinised this bill, but I didn't know that that, that that would be the law in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's important that, you know, that, that people who are going to have to be applying these laws and, and living up to them should be should be well, well aware of them as part of an education programme, I would have thought. Is it, I think, was it Tony McCauley was the next one I wanted to respond? I think it was, actually didn't. And then you, and that's, that's us finished. Yeah, I would certainly concur with the duty. Um, in terms of the FIR, yeah, it will come in in April next year. Um, if a retailer trader has guilty knowledge of a possible fraud, they've got to pass that information on. That duty has to be, be implied. And I do agree with, with uh, Mr Wallace's point on transparency. That is what is desperately needed, is transparency, but ultimately for the consumer. It's the consumer who, as, as the ultimate end person, has to have all the information. And it's something even as simple as, as we get, or still deal with, is substitution of spirits. The bottle of Smirnoff behind the bar, which it's, it's supermarket vodka that's in it. That's a very simplistic fraud. But someone again is paying a higher price for a branded vodka, whiskey, whatever, and getting a substituted spirit. Environmental health can take that as a, as a, a food safety offence. We in trade standards can take it as a trade standards offence under the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations. So there is, we can be creative in terms of how we enforce the legislation, but more transparency in the actual marketplace is desperately needed. You? Well, it sounds as if the duty to report is dealt with anyway. Uh, I've comment on the testing. The testing should be proportionate, otherwise we're, uh, you, you know, wasting resources. Uh, I would ask a more fundamental question, though, and that's why are we testing? We're testing the product to see if it is what it says on the tin or the pack. And, you know, one of the issues that the consumer faces is there's this too much confusing information on the pack. So, for example, some of the information on the pack, some of the logos and symbols currently being used don't actually mean anything. They have no legal definition. So to give you an example, the Scotch beef logo means that that... The meat has come from an animal which has been born, reared and processed in Scotland. The saltire on a packet of beef means nothing. It has no legal definition. And I think in some way in the labelling aspect, in terms of testing, to ask the question, why are we testing? We need to make sure that we're testing for the right reasons. And therefore, that the information on the pack is relevant to the consumer, to allow the consumer to make a decision and that the enforcement authorities can actually enforce what needs to be enforced. Okay, thank you. And you got the last word, Jill. So there, you, there, there you go. It was. <laughs> um, can, can I, um, on behalf of the committee, express our appreciation for all the time you've given this morning and the evidence um, uh, that you've provided has made this um, you know, quite a, an interesting session for us. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Suspend at this point until we set up for the next item on the agenda. Thanks very much.
I'll try to speak very well. Okay, folks, I'm going to start. Uh, we now move uh, to agenda item number four, which is our continuing scrutiny of uh, the NHS board budget. And today we're hearing from the Scottish Government. Um, we welcome Paul Gray, Director General, and Social Care and, Chi uh, 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 and, Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland. Welcome. Uh, Christine uh, McLaughlin, Deputy Director, Finance, Health and Wellbeing, and John Conaghan, Director for Health, Workforce and Performance, Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, I believe uh, that um, you wish to make uh, an opening statement. Thank you. thank you, Mr Gray. Thank you, Convener, and I will be brief. I just wanted to thank the committee for this opportunity to discuss um, the budgets. We, we start from a strong base in NHS Scotland budgets. We plan for the long term and the short term and we have clear financial planning assumptions. Our base is built on the fact that uh, boards have delivered services within financial plans for the, the last six years and continue to deliver efficiency savings at or above the target set. I wanted to assure the committee that budgets are not developed in isolation but form part of boards planning for service delivery and workforce and our methods of funding are designed to <clears throat> provide equity as well as stability and incentivise the right uh, behaviours in terms of efficiency and planning. Board's plans for 2014-15 will again deliver a balanced position, but we also recognise that it's becoming increasingly challenging to do so and this will continue. That's why we have such a strong focus on improvement and efficiency and also why we're taking forward uh, the very important work on the integration of health and social care. Um, convener, 
uh, if there's anything that the committee uh, would like to know about that we don't have immediately to hand today, I, I always give an undertaking to provide that as quickly as possible, and I will do so again. And I will make good use of my colleagues who are with me who have expertise in particular areas uh, in which the committee may have an interest. Thank you. Thank you for the short opening remarks. We'll go directly to questions. And the first question is from Annette Miller. As, as a member representing the North East of Scotland, it will probably come as no surprise to, to people in government that uh, I have a particular concern about the NRAC formula. Um, you know, given that at this point in time, Grampian is, is 34.7 million below parity, whereas NHS Glasgow and Clyde is more than that um, above parity. Um, I, I know that there's a name to to make, make things more equal over the next three years or so, but I would be interested to know um, how Scottish Government expects to find the resources to, to sort of bridge that gap, and uh, given the financial pressures on health boards, um, how the alignment to parity it will, will Greater Glasgow and Clyde be expected to, to receive that basically the reduction to get towards parity and Grampian that increase towards parity. Well, I'll, I'll ask Christine to say a little uh, more about the detail, but one of the reasons, of course, that we've set a trajectory to bring boards uh, close to parity within the next few years is to give them some uh, foresight of what we plan to do so that we don't introduce a series of shocks into the system. Um, we do recognise the pressures faced by boards, um, but uh, we seek to support them uh, through a number of measures, including interventions that John Conacher and his team uh, lead in order to ensure that where they face short-term pressures, they are supported. But Christine will give you um, a slightly more detailed account of our approach to moving towards NRAC parity. Yeah, if I can, the, the planning assumption within 2014-15 is that we're putting £47.5 million pounds into bringing boards closer to, to NRAC parity. Um, and over the, the next three years, we've got planning assumptions on um, additional funding as part of our budget setting process. So it's money that's put aside um, to bring those boards closer to parity. So the, the trajectory based on um, current figures for Grampian would show that the, the, the money that we're putting in over those next three years will bring them to within 1%. So that's about a, a planning assumption over that, that period of time. Um, the, the thing about NRAC, obviously, is that it's about relative shares um, and so we're, we're, we don't take money from any particular board. So it, a board that is funded above parity, we don't take money from them. But this is additional money that goes into boards that are further from parity. So um, all territorial boards are receiving a real terms increase in 14-15, and the plan is for that to continue in future years, so 15-16. So boards such as Greater Glasgow and Clyde would still receive a real terms increase in their funding, what they wouldn't get is that additional top-up on, on NRAC funding. So that's how we manage the relative shares to bring everybody to, um, so that no board is below 1% below parity, if that answers your question. Um, how can the NRAC formula guarantee that the allocated resources reflect the true needs of an area and are not just based on you know, the proportion of population and, and their, their age group, which I think has been the case? So I can give more information on the way that they do that, if you'd like um, more detail to follow up. But in general terms, the formula takes account of population, but it also takes into consideration um, morbidity and life circumstances and as an adjustment um, within the formula. We look at the number of hospital admissions in an area and the average length of stay. So, it, so there is a mechanism within it to try to understand the, the, the relative need and, and the cost of that need within each population, um, and there is a, a, a group um, that represents boards and has um, health economists on it, which tries to, to always be a, um, refining the formula as it goes. So there's currently work being done on acute morbidity and life circumstances um, over a two-year period. They're looking at whether they've, they take into account all of the, the relative factors to do that. Thanks. Um, to get back to the, the, the two board areas I mentioned, I mean, clearly the Grampian area doesn't have the, the extent of deprivation that, yeah. that the Greater Glasgow Clyde Board would have to deal with, but we do have a particularly 
rapidly ageing population in places like Aberdeenshire. And, and I think there are hidden pockets of deprivation that, that uh, you know, maybe don't always come to light. So I think there is, there is a real concern there, and, and, and you know, just mm. to get a bit more parity so that we, we, we can um, achieve what's best for the, the population as a whole. Okay. Just, just briefly then, convener. I mean, I think one of the reasons, as Christine McLaughlin has explained, we, we seek to keep a, a, a very close watching brief on the formula is that, of course, um, populations do change, and with population mobility, we want to be sure that we we reflect that. I I think no no funding formula will be perfect because it can't it can't change weekly or monthly. It changes slowly over time to reflect uh, changes in in population and other factors. We are, for example, um, looking to at the impact of providing remote and rural services, so um, addition of an element which would reflect variation in the cost of providing out of hours GP services ac across urban and rural geographies, and um, better reflecting the higher cost of providing s services in the, the, the islands. So we do tr try to keep the, the, the formula under close review and to ensure that if there are changes in circumstances, these are reflected. But, you know, given that the, 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 the allocation process that we've got, it, would, it, would it will never be a perfect fit to every circumstance. Thank you, Kimia. Yeah, uh, I've got a couple of speakers in, but I suppose you mentioned in your opening remarks, and I think it's important to us who live in the Glasgow Clyde area with um, representing constituency as well, the populations can change, usually uh, in a decline in direction, leaving behind, in good terms, the old and the, the lame, mm. the sick. That hasn't changed mm. over that period of time. The populations may change, but the need and the disproportionate need grows. And we've had evidence that while everyone accepts there's no perfect funding mechanism from both sides of that argument and evidence from senior people in these boards they both say that more work needs to be done to refine the, the, the system that we have and I think that was represented in evidence and I, you know, I've, I've, I don't know if you've seen that evidence yeah. or not and what is your response to it? Well again I'll turn to Christine in a second but I, I think convener it, it, it's fair to say that um, senior people in most boards can advance um, quite compelling arguments about the, the, the local conditions that they face. And I certainly don't in any way want to um, underestimate or undervalue the circumstances of multiple deprivation faced by individuals and communities served by the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. But that, uh, I suppose, is why we do keep this under review, and I, I think what, what I would want to avoid is, and I don't think it does happen, is NRAC turning into some sort of competition between or among boards. Um, it, I don't say this simply to make the point. It's as fair as we can make it at any given time, but, but changes will inevitably introduce elements of perceived unfairness, and that's why we try to keep it under review. But uh, do you want to hear more from Chris? Yes, yes, please. So, I mean, if you look at 1415, Greater Glasgow and Clyde is receiving um, an uplift, so it's 2.6% uplift. So, that, so there is, just to clarify, there is no reduction in that. Um, and that's, with the current formula, Glasgow receives a higher um, amount of funding than the, the formula would, would suggest based on the current assumptions. But the work that I referred to earlier that's currently underway it started in February this year on a review of acute um, morbidity and life circumstances. Mm -hmm. Glasgow are heavily involved in that. They've got a number of um, health economists, public health representation around that, that group to look at whether there is anything else that should be done to, to change that formula. Um, but final point I would make is also that, that every board in Glasgow included will have our best estimates of what the funding on NRAC is likely to be over the, the next three to five years, so that they also have some, some um, certainty on their financial planning over that period of time. Yeah. But if something well, changes in that formula, then we, we would t accept the recommendations of that group and make amendments to the right. formula. Yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, you know, given the efficiency saving target that Glasgow Clyde will, will be expected to meet, and given that they will not receive 
and currently their share on then what 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 sort of you know the, what is the comparison of the money allocated now and how, how much will that reduce over the coming year if you play in the efficiency savings and the the re reduced share or zero share of NRAC? Or? So the, the what, what, um, boards who are above parity don't receive the additional NRAC funding, but they receive their, their uplift, so 2.6% uplift to Glasgow in 2014-15. In um, the efficiency savings then that the Glasgow generate are all retained locally. Um, so none of that is... The, the, there's no cut to their, their, their baseline, so there's an increase in Glasgow's baseline. Um, with every other board. So the question, I think, really is about the, the, the value of efficiency savings that the board has to generate in order to maintain its services and, and redesign services and deal with the, the cost pressures going forward. So it's really about the, the, the efficiency savings value that uh -huh. they need to generate. But all of that funds, all those funds are retained within Greater Glasgow and Clyde for reinvestment. Yeah, but if you, if you take my basic point that there's a you know, disproportionate need here, it's not going to change over that three to four years. Yep. Will they have more or less money to work with to meet that need over the next three or four years? The, the, in, in baseline terms, they will have more more money no, rather than less money. Have, you know, if, you know, in simple terms, if they've got hundred pounds now, will they have a hundred pounds in four years' time, or will it be less or more? It will be more because they'll have an uplift every year. But I guess your point is, what do they need to do with that money? Yeah, right. But, but in, in absolute terms, they will have more money rather than less money. In absolute terms, but it will not increase proportionately with inflation? Or... The, the, there will be the real terms, the, the uplift to their baseline, so 2.6% 2, 2 is the uplift to their, uh -huh. to their baseline in Glasgow. There's no cut to Glasgow's funding. Right. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out this, because you said in your opening remarks that, that they wouldn't get that element of NENRAC funding. Sorry, they, they won't get the additional uplift that, that, that such as Grampian get. Ah. So, so, so how can they? How can they the same money if they don't get the additional? So, 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 Gramp, so everybody gets a baseline, which I think is two point five percent. Now, Glasgow gets two point six, reflecting ah. different circumstances. Then, on top of that, uh, uh, Grampian will get an additional uplift to bring them closer to parity. So, so Glasgow is, is not needing to be given uplifts to bring them closer to parity, but they are getting 2.6 as opposed to 2.5, recognising the circumstances that are uh -huh. prevailing. Um, so, so everybody's getting the 2.5, at least. Glasgow gets 2.6, but in addition, Grampian gets a bit more because it needs to be brought to with what, what, in one percent. I know. I mean, we could give you a table. Uh, genuinely. Yeah, yeah. I think you. Yeah. I think you need. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to make it simple, if I can, Glasgow will get two point six percent. Grampian will get four point six percent of an uplift in two thousand fourteen fifteen. So all boards get an uplift, but there's different levels. I think uh, on the NRAC funding and the funding element, I think Rhoda Grant wants to come in. Um, Richard Simpson wants to come in. Is there anyone else on that theme before we move to the next question, led by Aileen McLeod? No? Okay. Rhoda? Okay. Um, just a, a point of clarification to start with. Um, you say everyone gets an uplift in real terms, so they get an increase in real terms. Is that uh, based on basic inflation, or is that based on health inflation? It's just based on basic GTP deflator, which is the core... Okay. Um, definition of real terms for, for the government. Okay. And in real terms, if you were basing that on health inflation, what would that mean? Um, I, I don't have that comparator um, Could we available get just that? now. That would be useful. Could we get that in writing? Yep. But I, 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 I don't think we actually have a definition of a... Um, I, right, what I can give you is the um, cost pressures and the inflation that boards identify as a cost within, but I, don't, I wouldn't have an equivalent of the GTP for, okay. for health. It used to be that there was a, a figure for health inflation. What, what I can give you is the, um, the figures that boards quote as the inflationary factor for different pressures, such as pay and, um, and prescribing, if that would help. That would be but I, can, I can give you something in writing on that, and also the, uh, if I can give you the table on the percentage uplifts for each board so that you can understand the difference between each board. OK. Um, and I suppose my second, the second part of my question, just in, in, for clarification, is the NRAP formula a bit of a blunt instrument? Is it responsive enough to changing circumstances? It seems 
I mean, you know, even just taking Highland for an example, um, you know, they've been trying to cut budgets for so long and now they're suddenly underfunded. Um, it seems to me that changes happen, um, but they're not reflected quickly enough within the formula. I mean, I think, uh, as, as I said earlier, um, NRAC is, is the best instrument we've got at the moment, but it is not... You know, it is not an instrument that allows us to make um, significant in-year changes, for example, to reflect changing circumstances. But were we to do so, we would then be in a position of boards being in a, in a position of great uncertainty about what their budgets would actually be. So the combination of taking in the factors that affect the formula and giving boards current and future certainty is one that we have to balance carefully. But it is... It is an imperfect instrument, but it is the best one we have, is, is how I would describe it. And it's, it, it, was, it replaced, I think, the Arbuthnot formula, which preceded it. And a lot of work went into producing NRAC to make it more flexible and more responsive. So it's certainly, it is certainly a flexible and responsive instrument, but it, I don't think any such instrument in the world could be claimed to be perfect, and I wouldn't do so. Richard? Of course, we've been at this for a long, long time. I mean, 1976, when uh, the principal of Harriet Watt, Robin Smith, did the original share uh, system to try and redistribute funds, so we've never quite got to the parity situation. I, I, really slightly beyond that, that I, I had two sm short, small questions. One was, given that Glasgow has had above its share uh, under NRAC, given also that it is a blunt instrument, you know, what, what, what do you do in terms of holding them to account on the fact that health inequalities have not improved at all in Glasgow? I mean, it's, it's all very well. NRAC, one of the, big, the two big things are age and deprivation. I mean, there's a thing about rurality as well. But let's just stick to deprivation for the moment. If deprivation is one of the main features of the distribution formula, then the areas with high levels of distribution should be applying those funds to tackling health inequalities. How are you holding them to account to doing that? Well, we hold them to account through the, the heat targets they have, and I'll, I'll bring colleagues in, in, in a second. I think, um, without wanting to deflect your question, Dr Simpson, I would say that I would not hold a health board individually to account in relation to health inequalities. I believe it's an issue that stretches across the range of public services and voluntary services that, we, that are commissioned in any area and one of the things we're doing for example through the early years collaborative is to try to recognize that the only way to tackle persistent health inequalities or persistent inequalities in general is to have cross-sector working that, that delivers locally. Um, I think that some of the things we're, we're doing uh, around for example the, the, the Child Smile program is, a, is an evidence of attempting to tackle health inequalities, they're of long standing, they're persistent and they're deep rooted and as the convener has said, the, 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 the risk that um, population shift means that the, the, the inequality is actually increased, not decreased, is one that we're, we're very alert to. I, I do know that um, uh, Linda de Kastiker, the, 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 the Director of Public Health in, in uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, takes this whole agenda very seriously. Um, and I don't know whether colleagues want to say more about the specifics, John, on, on health inequalities. Uh, can I just maybe amplify some of the um, comments that you made in relation to heat targets? Yeah. So um, over the years, we've had a number of um, things for boards to pursue, like, for example, um, increasing dental registrations, um, reducing suicide rates, um, delivery of smoking cessation targets, um, drug and alcohol waiting times, um, child and adolescent mental health, um, infection rates, etc. And some of these clearly related to um, deprivation and inequalities. So we will want to see um, relatively better performance um, um, for boards that are actually below the norm in some of those areas. Uh, and when you track heat performance over the years, you will see that boards set individual trajectories that are part of LDP, a local delivery planning, sign off on an annual basis. So that's one of the ways that we can potentially hold boards to account for relative differences in performance. Richard? Yes. 
the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the was really, uh, um, Paul Gray's already alluded to it, and that is shifting the balance. I mean, I, the Audit Scotland reports have been very clear on this, that there's not a great deal of evidence of shifting the balance of care. Uh, and, and we're hearing that, uh, you know, we're getting an increasing campaign now from the general practitioners, and I should declare an interest as a fellow of the Royal College of GPs and a member of the BMA, uh, but, you know, we are hearing a, a considerable uh, clamour. I think it's becoming a clamour now from GPs, and certainly my correspondence bag is really filling up with GPs feeling under, under massive pressure, um, and, and yet their share proportionately of the budget has actually gone down, uh, rather as a share has gone down rather than up. I, admittedly on a, you know, on a rising tide, but, uh, but their tide's been rising less than the others. Um, so my other question is, you know, related to NRAC, what, 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 how do you hold them to account for shifting the balance? Well, again, I'll ask colleagues to say a bit about the local delivery plans and, and the, the trajectory that we're setting and the expectation that we're setting to health boards about the way in which they um, fund primary care in general. But I'm very clear that primary care has a fundamental role to play in the integration of health and social care. And um, when we get to the point of having the integrated joint boards fully established and the, the, the functions up and running completely, um, I would expect that o over time that will help us to shift care in the direction of out-of-hospital care. And when we have said that our, our um, vision for the health service is that by 2020 more people will be living longer, healthier lives in home or a homely setting. And I mean, that, that vision speaks for itself. I'm using deliberately, uh, Dr. Simpson, the broader term uh, primary care. General practitioners yes. make an enormous contribution, but there is also a very valuable sure. contribution from the, the wider primary care family. And I mean, I'm quite happy to say to this committee that, that I regard um, the the utilisation of primary care as a key component of the successful delivery of the integration of health and social care. Thank you for that, because it, it, I entirely accept that it's about speech and language therapy and physiotherapy and, and community nurses and school nurses uh, and all, all these groups as well. Um, but I, I, I wonder, is it possible for you to let us have uh, the local delivery plans, which I know encompass this area, which because you've made it a point, um, um, are they now available? Are they public on the public domain? And if not, uh, when could the committee get hold of them to have a look um, at what's actually planned in uh, terms of shifting all, the balance? Uh, all local delivery plans are available on board websites, so they're available right now and have been for yeah. some months. I think what might be useful um, to draw the committee's attention to this is um, for us to also give you the guidance that we sent out to boards this year in terms of producing those plans, because that, I think, might be useful for you to understand the context of how these plans were set. Um, I think also, um, in the fullness of time, uh, the committee needs to be briefed on the health and wellbeing outcomes that we're currently consulting on as part of integration. Um, that consultation is um, currently underway, but I think that's another important factor in terms of shifting the balance of care. Thank you. That's very helpful. Bob Doris, with an intervention. Yeah, very, very brief supplementary um, in, in relation to this. Um, so in terms of the share of the budget that general practice gets, maybe this is more of a, an accounting uh, question, but two things that are going on just now, for example, in the deep end projects in Glasgow, there's link workers being based there. Now, there's a cash cost to that, uh, but it, it alleviates pressures from GPs in those deep end practices because those link workers are dealing with matters that otherwise a GP would, would deal with. I'm not sure whether that shows up in the GP's budget or another budget. So that's an example of a spend that contributes towards general practice. I'm not sure how that's accounted for. And the second one would be with prescription for excellence. For example, one of the first work streams is in relation to medications reviews and health boards have been given money. Now, my understanding is Glasgow has some work on this already and some of that money will go into health centres and working beside general practices in relation to pharmacists going in and doing some medications review. Again, it's not money to GPs, but it relieves pressures and burdens upon GPs. Does that money, as an accountancy term, does that go towards share of spend in general practice? Because I'm not actually sure we're capturing all the public spend in general practice appropriately. So it might be a false share we're looking at 
maybe you might write us in relation to that, but it's just where does that fit, fit, sit on the budget line? Thanks, Mr. Doris. We'd certainly be happy to do that and to ensure that the, 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 the um, funds provided are properly represented. And I, I do want to take the opportunity, uh, since you mentioned the deep end practices, to say um, I, I've had some experience through conversation of, of what they're doing, and it's an extremely valuable piece of work that I think sits well with the approach that we are trying to uh, take to, to tackling really very persistent inequalities. So they, they're, a, they're a really good example of, of, of work in progress. Okay, thank you. Aileen McLeod, thanks for your patience. Thank you, Convener. I actually wanted to come back to the health and social care integration agenda because uh, obviously our health boards and local authorities will be required to put in place um, the local integrated arrangements by April next year um, with the full integration of services by um, April the following year and obviously the key is going to be how we implement this on the ground so I know that the, uh, the Scottish Government has made available an additional resource of £100 million pounds for the, um, the integrated care fund so just to kind of ask um, Mr Gray for um, some more detail about what the actual criteria um, that will be used um, to determine I guess like the allocation and the distribution um, of that fund and how it will be implemented to make sure that there is kind of real and genuine um, partnership and collaborative approaches between the different uh, key stakeholders. I'll, I'll turn to um, Christian in, in, in a second. I think the, the, for me, and, and we'll speak about the formal criteria in a second, but for me the key criterion on the integration fund is that, that it's used to fund projects or implementations that make a real difference to the way that we deliver services for the benefit of people. Um, the, 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 there will be much more in terms of criteria, but f for my part, the, the, the focus of the integration of health and social care is to ensure that we provide, within the resources we have available, the best possible services to individuals and that our that our approach to delivering service is focused on need rather than a provider-centric approach. So for my part, a key uh, element of what I would look to see delivered through the integration uh, fund is that focus on individuals and communities. But, but Christine can say more about the detail. Yeah, I guess just to put it in, in the context, obviously in, in the, the year that we're looking at just now, 2014-15, we still have the, the final year of the change fund, and the fund that you're referring to um, is 2015-16 for, for one year. Um, in addition to that, we also have funding for partnerships for integration support to transition funding, um, and £7 million has just been agreed to go out to partnerships. Um, so there, there are the three different components, really, in, in terms of what you're talking about. So the, 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 the 100 million for partnerships, um, we, would, we would expect it to be developed in partnership as the change fund has been, so between NHS boards, local authorities and, and the third sector. Um, and we'll be giving the partners um, further guidance on, on that shortly so that they can um, develop their plans. But it's very much about being an enabler um, to unlocking some of the, the improvement that we're looking to see. So partnerships will already have a good sense of, of what they believe um, that money could be used for um, in, in preparation for, for integration. But I think I would see it as um, th they will be able to make good use of the final year of the change fund in this financial year. So it's not really about waiting until 15, 16. The strong message to us, to all partners, is to be getting on with this now, to be looking at that change fund money this year, to, to be pump priming some of the things that we'd look to see, and although there'll be a slightly different criteria um, for 15, 16, th those key themes about working together in partnership, um, about keeping people out of hospital and having um, services in, in the community and people's home setting will, will be um, themes that will apply in 15, 16. What, what the, the one difference for the 15, 16 fund on integrating care is um, a, a recognition that this applies to the under 65s as well, um, and people with, with um, multi complex needs um, that, that would be looking to see some impact on that, that age group within the, the, the fund in 15 16. 
And how will that, um, sorry, how will that link in with the strategic commissioning um, and with the national health and wellbeing outcomes themselves? So the, 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 the par partners are already starting to work on draft um, strategic plans. So they'll be able to look at what the, their, their plans are for using the, the change fund in 1415 and using the integrating care fund in 2015-16 in as some of their enablers to deliver against their, their ambitions for their plans. So, so it does start now. A number of partnerships already have draft strategic plans that they're, they're building just now. So they'll be looking to see what their plans were for the use of those, um, those non-recurring funds to try to, to kick-start some of their initiatives. That's very helpful. Thanks very much. Maybe that's something that can be shared with the committee, just in terms of you know, the integrated fund itself, just so we can kind of see where it sort of sits with everything else around health and social care. That's I, th I think, we, as a committee, I think we would, you know, you know, we first of all accept the principle that this is, you know, whether it be integration or whether it be looking at collaboration or dealing with these issues, I think we, we are at the stage, not formally, but we are at a stage that this is not simply the responsibility of health, although health is a big part to play. Um, I think we would, we would be looking for now or even later about what lessons we learned from how the change funds previously were spent, whether they... We are, we, we, we are confident that the, the third uh, involuntary sector, who complained bitterly to us that we, we, you know, weren't having the sign-off that they had and felt the poor relations at the wedding and all, all, all of that, I think the, these are uh, important issues. And I would be interested to know that we've got uh, £100 million pounds here for, for that integration. Uh, uh, that what are others bringing to the party, accepting that there are many issues here that will be an education budget, that, uh, uh, you know, a, a justice budget, or a, you know, social work budgets. Where you're contributing 100 million, what, what is the pot going to be like? I suppose to ensure that that uh, these initiatives through integration and collaboration on these issues are are getting the, the maximum buying uh, from from others. I think that's a fair point, Convener, and we'll certainly bring forward some of the lessons we've learned already from the change funds. I think that one of the tests of all of this will be when we get to the 15-16 um, financial year and beyond, uh, seeking to be fully uh, integrated by the end of that year. Um, one of the tests will be, and it will apply equally to health <laughs> as to every other portfolio, um, the, 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 the sense of real willingness to devote resource to making this happen and ensuring that there is a, there is a sense of equity and parity. And I, I don't want to pass by your point about the third sector. One of the things that I have um, been consistent in saying to senior colleagues in the health service is we've got to make it as easy as possible for the third sector to make the contribution they make. Um, and not to over bureaucratise our approach to engaging with the third sector. Uh, thanks for that. Could you give us an update about you know what's going on now with COSLA and yourselves at the department in regards to you know at one at one stage here we had an evidence here. Uh, we were top slicing your budget and handing it over, and we, and we know that there has been, I'm sure, constructive discussion around these issues about who's funding what and whether funds can and will transfer. If, uh, uh, there has been ongoing discussions you've referred to. What, what stage are, are those discussions at? Well, I think I think the the, the, the discussions um, are, are are continuing, and I think um, I understand that. Uh, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary and um, Peter Johnston uh, are about to issue a, a letter of guidance to the, uh, to the Health Board Chief Executives about the policy expectations. So I wouldn't want to preempt that, but I, 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 my understanding is that should go out shortly, and I would uh, want to make sure it was shared with the committee immediately. I don't know whether, Christine, you want to say any more on the discussions with COSLA at this stage? Yeah, one, one thing that, um, that has, I think, been quite consistent is that there will be um, a, an identification of resources in relation to the total spend on adult social care, and, and that needs to cover community, um, hospital care in the community, it needs to cover um, social care, and it needs to cover the part of acute care that relates to that, Change, that population. So um, all of that resource, we're, we're, um, partners are, are currently working on how they, they identify 
all of that resource and the use the integrated resources framework. I know some of the you had discussion with some of the territorial board directors of finance about that. The integrated resource framework allows partners to identify um, the resources through the whole um, pathway, and that's that that will be the basis of of um, of the the costs that are transparent then for the partnerships going forward. Good. Thank you. Yeah, um, can I return to heat targets, but not in the way you may think that I'm going to talk about them? Um, previously serving on the Rural Affairs Com Climate Change Committee, uh, that committee is interested in, in asking other committees to look at their uh, contribution to reduction in climate change. The Scottish Government has an excellent programme, uh, but in some ways we haven't met it. Can, you, can I ask what your department is doing to reduce uh, energy consumption if we take the budget as a whole, uh, 12, 13 million, approaching 13 million, uh, what's the current energy costs within the, that budget or overall all the boards? I'm sure you'll have that figure that you could give me straight away. Um, but basically the situation is that, uh, you know, you go into uh, any uh, health uh, hospital you know, the costs are, are basically um, staff, etc., but energy costs, a tremendous cost. And 365 days a year, yeah. most lights are on. What are we doing to reduce energy costs within the, the NHS? Well, Mr Carnahan will, will give us uh, something on that. And, Christine, if you want to follow up. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think what we need to do is um, just reflect on the question you've given us about the um, amount of money that's in here and what we're doing to reduce that. Um, and and I, I, I'm afraid I don't have those figures to hand, but we can, we can send them to you. But you did mention heat targets, and um, we actually have heat targets to reduce energy-based carbon dioxide emissions and to continue a reduction in energy consumption to contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets set in the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. So we have, we've got something specifically there for boards to chase, um, and, it, uh, and perhaps as part of the um, submission that we give back to you, we can give you an update on where boards are in delivering that. I can just add to that, you know, annually we have the State of the NHS Scotland Assets and Facilities Report, and, and from that, um, what we've identified is that energy consumption is reduced by 97 um, and that boards are continuing to reduce energy consumption and the estimate is it would have cost around £9 million higher if we hadn't had that reduction in the last 12 months. So basically taking active steps, putting uh, better, uh, well, reduced lighting, not reduced lighting, but you know the better uh, type of lamps that they give a, uh, the same light, but reduced uh, energy costs. Yes, and the, the, the new um, hospital in Glasgow is being designed in, in line with the, the, you know, the latest energy efficiency standards. So when we're opening uh, or, 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 or developing new premises, we're making sure that uh, they conform. Um, but we can, we can give more detail from individual boards, as John Conaghan has said, but the overall uh, reduction, as, as Christine McLaughlin has said, has saved us £9 million and reduced carbon emissions so far. Uh, so you can, you know, I certainly welcome the fact that, you know, the, the, actually in this building we've reduced substantially uh, energy costs and I, I welcome the fact of the good news that you've actually reduced your energy consumption too. Thank you. Bob Doris. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, I suppose um, I should declare an interest as Dr Simpson did. I'm afraid I don't have any particular qualifications that Mr Simpson did, but I'm going to ask about workforce planning tools in relation to nursing, and my wife is a nurse, so I suppose you put that on the record that I, tell, I, I say to my wife how wonderful the NHS is on a daily basis, and then she tells me what happens on her ward on a daily basis, and sometimes the truth lies, lies in the middle some, somewhere. But, but in, in, in relation to workforce planning tools, um, there has been a lot of progress made in conjunction with the RCA and other stakeholders to, to nail down, in certain circumstances, um, the, the size and the shape of the workforce and the workload that they're expected to do. Um, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how that relates to future budget settlements, because obviously workforce is the, the largest part of the NHS budget in terms of headcounts, a very politicised affair as well. So some more information about how that workforce and workload management tools feeds into budget settlements would be would be quite helpful. So not just for the current year we're scrutinising, but going forward, where would you signpost us to scrutinise the way forward, quite frankly, in relation to that? But also what the, the Scottish Government plans are and maybe 
developing that a bit forward, a bit further. So we've got allied health professionals going to have a, an additionally significant role, particularly with health and social care integration. We're going to have a lot of change in the workforce as it's a lot more community based. So. Um, I'm delighted. It's not a matter of just saying, isn't it good that we have a workforce uh, planning tool? That's a good thing. But by its very nature, it's going to have to develop and change quite radically in the years ahead. So how will that be managed? And I suppose what I'm asking, how, how will the financial underpinning of that be fed into NHS budgets? OK, thanks for that. I'll, I'll bring both John and, and Christine in on that. But I think the, the, the thing just to mention for the committee uh, is that this year, the, the, the use of these uh, tools is now mandated. So, in the past, it was it was optional. We believe that it was right to move to making it mandatory, and we have, um, I think, already seen uh, some improvements in the way that uh, boards have been able to assign the resources currently available to them. But, John, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, I think it was two thousand and eight nine that we introduced the um, first work for workforce workload planning tools, for, particularly for nursing in the NHS in Scotland. And in 2010-11, the RCN, national RCN held up Scotland as uh, an example of good practice in this area and commended that approach to the rest of the UK. So I think you're right to say that Scotland did a little bit of um, path-breaking on this one. Now, those tools have developed over the past three or four years. Uh, and um, our Director General has um, intimated that we have now made these mandatory because we think they work, they produce um, good results. And um, in terms of how they relate to budgets, we expect each board to produce an annual workforce plan. We have um, uh, guidance out on that on CEL 23 2011 that was issued, where each board is required to produce an annual workforce plan and indeed the projection and to relate that to two other things. First of all, budgets but also uh, relate that to service changes. Um, so workforce planning itself cannot take place in isolation. It needs to have some degree of triangulation with the resource that's available, but also some degree of triangulation available with service changes and plans. And all of those are subjected to the annual planning process, but also boards are requested also to look further ahead, such that they have some forecast of um, workforce planning requirements. And all of that, as I say, is um, refreshed on an annual basis. Um, you mentioned the development of tools, um, where, where most of the tools currently in practice are in, um, uh, are in for nursing. Uh, we are considering how we can expand these. Um, uh, we have opened some discussions around expanding the use of the workload planning tool into action emergency departments, which will cover not just nursing, but also cover um, doctors and allied health professionals. Uh, and, but that's at a relatively early stage, and I think certainly in the fullness of time we can come back to say to the committee how we're developing into other areas when we're a bit further down the track. Okay, I, I suppose yeah, no, that, that, that's helpful. Um, but I suppose what I'm trying to do is um, link it to the budget scrutiny that, that, that that's taking place. And you're quite right to point out that you don't change staffing skills mixes overnight. And there's a wider picture on health and social care integration is, is hopefully developing a pace. Um, at any point, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know um, across party there's a, a dramatic move away from ring fencing. In terms of how that staff mix is funded by territorial health boards, um, would that be part of an NRAC formula? Uh, would that be... Um, just part of the normal uplift. So Greater Glasgow and Clyde got their 2.6%. Um, so they get a they get a real terms above inflation increase, not not a dramatic amount, but you know it's still it's still an increase. Did that take into account the staffing mix when that was done, or was it a case of health boards have to manage large budgets and redesign services themselves? I, I'm trying to get. I suppose what I'm trying to ask is how much is this micromanaged from the top, and how much is it for health boards to get on? with uh, using the, the, the mandatory planning tools and designing the service accordingly. Okay, I, I think I made just a few other additional remarks on that, but Christine will fill in some details. Um, uh, I think I'm right in saying that um, NHS boards simply have that broad NRAC allocation and then they need to determine how best to use that for their local population. Taking into account uh, the mix of what they have available at local level in terms of um, 
um, expenditure on fixed cost and resources versus variable cost, which is um, uh, workforce. Because not all boards are obviously at the same place in terms of their investment plans around the bricks and mortar that they have available. So there needs to be some degree of local flexibility. Um, uh, the other thing I should have mentioned in relation to workforce and workload tools is that there is a significant element of discretion which is left um, to local practitioners, local managers, local clinicians um, and senior nurses in terms of how they adjust what the workforce planning tool tells them for local circumstances. So if they have, for example, um, a mix of patients that's perhaps more frail than the norm, then they have the ability to adjust that workforce tool to provide for additional staff to cope with that um, uh, requirement for flexibility. Yeah, as you say, it's, it's very much in the board's discretion. Their, their baseline funding, which is the majority of, of the funding for territorial health boards, um, will comprise those nursing costs. So it's for the board to look at their service redesign, um, to look at their efficiency savings plan, and to look at how they manage all of that whilst also taking account how they achieve change, so their, their turnover levels, for instance, would, would form part of that. Um, so, we, so we don't micromanage that process, but we do look at how boards compare um, and what they're doing in the relative percentages, and, and we would always look to, to understand why there are differences across boards, but um, it's for the boards to decide how to use that baseline funding um, in, in the provision of services for their population. Well, can we, I suppose the briefest of comments rather than another question. Uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. We're trying to develop how we can best do board, board budget scrutiny. And maybe that, that, there's a more detailed question we, we should have been asking of boards in relation to where do you see your nursing staff numbers in three years' time? What are your budget assumptions around that in this particular year and how you move towards it and identify other pressures? But I suppose that's not necessarily a question for yourselves, but we're just trying to get a meaningful way of developing budget scrutiny around something as significant as, as nursing numbers and, and the workload. Yes. Thank, thank you, Convener. I mean, the other thing, of course, that the committee will want to bear in mind is that NHS Education Scotland looks ahead on demand for uh, training places of, you know, for, for nurses and doctors and uh, so forth. So there is, there is also a long-term planning horizon to ensure that we have the right as far as we can, the right number of people available to come into the system in years to come. So it's, the committee is right to recognise that it's a complex environment, but, but what we certainly don't attempt from the centre to reach down to hospital and ward level and try to define dispositions there. You know, and I think it was a, a, you know, a very relevant line of question, not just for the the committee's scrutiny work, but in terms of the future of the NHS, because I think maybe Mr Conaghan presented figures here, certainly from his department a couple of years ago, that showed clearly there would be a reduction in nurses, but a substantial increase in allied professionals. Um, and I presume that that fitted in with a, you know, an idea about where we're going, the 2020 vision, more people treated at home. Then, what my concern is in general about all of this that we've got we've got a workforce planning tool that is focused in and around nurses we we have some recent announcements about appointments to a and e and whatever you know i don't know if that was part of the long term planning but going back to your triangle um about the money available of course the service changes in plans and what was the other, the, 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 the other and one? The, and the uh, resulting workforce. That's and the resulting required. workforce. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether that's a triangle or whether that's a seesaw, um, you know, in terms of the, the political pressures that we're all working under. Maybe it's, it's, it's Bob's right, there's a, a session that we need to do in workforce planning. But are, we, are you confident that currently that we're planning the workforce of the future, which is based on... The number. Of, this is how we measure it, and we need to get out of this. We measure it on the number of consultants, the number of nurses, the number of hospitals, the number of procedures in the hospitals. That, you know, and we don't get that focus about where 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 the new workforce, what the new workforce is going to look like. 
Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've recently done a fairly large piece of work, um, in fact it's been about a year, year and a half in preparation um, on um, what I would call the very highest levels of best practice in um, strategic level planning for the workforce and it might be useful if um, the kind of uh, guidance that we're in the process of issuing to boards, we give you a sight of that. It's, it's a good piece we of work. We would welcome that. Um, and, and what that does is that helps boards look five, ten years in the future. It brings together all the evidence that we've been able to collect over the past year and a half in terms of what really um, happens. Uh -huh. But if, if I can also make a, um, just another thought for the, for, for the committee here, uh, and that is that... Um, we shouldn't set or stall out that um, more staff of a particular, uh, in a particular area is perhaps the only way forward. Um, staff mix changes, um, skill mix changes, um, and services change. So if I was going to say, for example, the introduction of one-stop clinics um, in the past 10 years in Scotland uh, has meant that um, uh, the requirement for, let's say, half a dozen clinics staffed by um, half a dozen sets of administrative staff have now reduced. Um, it's a better deal for patients, but we've tended to put the savings and the, the changes that have been associated with that into, let's say, clinical staff. So that's why um, uh, I think when I scan down the NHS workforce, I can see significant changes in staff groups, um, and all of that against um, a plan that says this is how we're going to do it and refreshed annually by boards. So I'm, I'm quite happy to give you something, I think, on I wider think we, the, I think we'd appreciate that, because I mean, I just can't get this 2020 focus a bit closer to home, nearer to home, and we are planning, you know, the, 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 you know, the clinicians of the future, and, you, know, the, you know, it's all hospital-based in, 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 in our thinking. I don't know what, and going back to our original point, well, this is not just an issue for health, about whether we're planning the workforce in relationship to not just the, clinic, the, the clinical workforce, but in terms of what we need in the community, in terms of social work, in terms of supporters, in terms of carers. And given Aileen's um, uh, you know, issue earlier about uh, commissioning of these services, then we need, we need to know where that workforce is going to come from. So it's pretty important. It's a very good point, convener, and I think one of the, the key tasks for the integrated joint boards will be to give foresight on um, workforce uh, requirements, because you're absolutely right to say that, that by no means all of the workforce that provides care will come from within health. The one figure I would put in front of the committee, and I'm, I'm deliberately um, taking it uh, out of any political space by quoting starting in September 2009, uh, there were 9,579 allied health professionals, for example, occupational therapy and all the others we mentioned. And in March 2014, there were 11,194. And I simply make that point that if I look at that compared to the changes in other um, staffing ratios within the health service, there has the, the, the most significant increase that I can see is in relation to... Um, the allied uh, health professionals. Similarly, personal and social care has gone up from 763 in September 2009 to 909 in March 2014. So, um, I, I am deliberately making a comparison within one, uh, you know, within one one government's term of office. Uh, but just to show that trajectory is, is yes. there on yes. some of these relevant... But, of course, we've been reminded here in committee hearings before that what we what we find difficult to do is change the existing services. Yes. So we add on services, but we don't we don't necessarily <laughs> tackle the others. But anyway, I mean, I think it is a, 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 an interesting area that we would we would happily engage with uh, the Scottish Government in, uh, in exploring. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I suppose the other one that leads on to quickly is uh, the other side of that argument, but where there are concerns about the shifts in the, the you know, the, whether it be nursing care and availability, whatever, there's a whole question of, of, of quality and indeed uh, some of the, 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 the savings that... Um, that are being proposed by by uh, the special boards are indeed in and around uh, reducing the number of people that they they employ. You know, so um, how do we how do we do that safely uh, in, the, in the in the process? Maintain that quality and achieve these changes in the workforce that we need to achieve. 
I mean, I think what we don't do is 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 uh, drop our drop our quality standards. I think also, I mean, I've had a number of interesting uh, conversations, for example, with uh, the ambulance service about the changes they've already made to the way that they deliver services, um, which provide uh, a much higher level of care to people before they reach any hospital-based setting. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of what we do in that is take advantage of new techniques and new technologies. Um, we're also benefiting from uh, the implementation uh, and spreading the implementation of telehealth and telecare, which removes uh, some of the need for uh, home visits. And I've seen that working very effectively in NHS Ayrshire and Arran, and I only pick that as an example. Um, but I don't know, Christine or John, if you want to come in on the um, way in which we ensure quality in, in the delivery by special boards in particular against the resource pressures we, we face. Yeah, I think the, some of the evidence that you, you heard from um, people like, like Simon Belfer from National Services Scotland was about the real focus on um, things like rationalising the estate and, um, and within their efficiency. So there, in some ways, I think there may be an exemplar to how to go about this type of, of review. They've looked at um, what, what they could make more efficient with the way in which they provide services and their overall infrastructure um, and the staff savings that they've been able to, to make have been ones that they were able to make within their existing turnover levels. Um, the very, very successful programme of redeployment and retraining for staff in quite specialised areas. So they've been able to, to do all that um, within the context for, sport, for special health boards that returned funding um, of £144 million over, over four years and doing all that within existing um, policies of, of no compulsory redundancy. So I think some of those examples that they, they gave you are um, areas that we'd like to see spread, spread more in some cases across the board, so special health boards have had a different set of circumstances, have had a different uplift in that time, and we've set them some quite challenging savings targets, um, whilst also looking for them to be the boards who can generate savings within the territorial health boards as well. So I think it's quite a, a positive story um, from, from the special health boards. Can I, can, yes. I, can, can I give you an example uh, which perhaps um, uh, more directly answers your question about the quality and cost balance? Okay, um, and um, each um, e each year we um, support across Scotland um, uh, what we call a framework for quality, efficiency, and value, and this is where we try to spread uh, spread best practice and and, and support. Um, uh, lower cost but better quality. And here's one example that's called the Productive General Practice uh, for Practice Nurses. Uh, and this is a little um, uh, uh, project that we're currently running across Scotland where we outline what the benefits are to practice teams, um, streamlining activity across the practice, eliminating waste, and enabling practice nurses to add value and spend more time with patients. So that's a practical example um, in Productive General Practice where we can see um, a lower cost base being achieved, but a little bit better in, um, uh, um, outcomes in terms of quality. Uh, and there are many examples. In fact, um, there's an annual report which is published, um, which gives uh, quite a number of examples across all health boards in Scotland that the committee might want to see in relation to that. OK. Thank you for that. Are there, is, is there any other questions from the committee? I mean, the only, I suppose the last one has been, there's a long list here, but the whole question of preventable spend that the, 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 the committee has been interested in. And, uh, you, know, you know, again, maybe following on from your recent uh, contribution there is about how the Scottish Government is supporting um, boards and estimating preventable savings. Um, um, because what we got in response to the questions and the questionnaire and indeed, um, and, and the whole question of preventable spend, and they, they're, they're, there were some people were saying, well, it's not, it's, we couldn't, it's not possible to provide you with, um, you know, uh, financially qualified, you know, uh, savings, etc. And there seem to be, if you look at the questionnaires. Um, whether they fully understand the the, the, the question of you know, outputs and outcomes. You know, you, you, the evidence there for you to see, and I don't know how much work that you actually do in this area, 
um, uh, and whether you need to do more work in this area in terms of to, 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 to bring about a situation where they can identify what they're doing, they can identify what the, the, the preventative strategy is going to gain, and they, they clearly understand uh, you know, the outputs from outcomes. I mean, Karina, you make a very fair point. I think the first thing to say to the committee is I don't think there's ever going to be a line in any health board budget that says preventative spend in a, in a very clearly encapsulated, this is it, you know, this is the percentage. The, the difficulty is that <clears throat> quite a lot of what we do is, is preventative spend. So, for example, um, the the um, statin therapy as part of the management strategy for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease for adults um, and there's a there's an economic model that's been developed by the department of health in england which estimated that vascular checks in all those aged 40 to 74 years every five years was cost effective um, the, the, the reason I mention these two things is simply because there are preventative activities that are undertaken as part of a regular visit to a GP surgery. Um, there are preventative activities undertaken by NHS 24. When people phone up, they get advice. They do something that prevents them from having to go to hospital. Um, there, are, there are preventative activities that we're doing around um, exercise and well-being. And, and to try to encapsulate these down into, into budget lines is virtually impossible. However, I think your point about outcomes is the place for us to is the place for us to look. Because what I'm really keen that we should do more on is understanding, to put it very simply, the value for money of intervention. So that if we are in a, an age as we are of resource constraints every every area is, everybody in the public and private sector is, then making sure that when we are making interventions, they're the ones most likely to deliver positive outcomes for people and for communities. Part of that, I think, is about allowing, uh, involving people and communities in the discussions about what would work for them. I think that a sort of top-down imposition of solutions is not is not always effective. So part of our programme in the integration of health and social care is to ensure that, that conversations happen in localities that actually are meaningful to them. Because I'm quite certain, convener, that what will work in your constituency might not work in the, in one or two of the constituencies represented by other members of this uh, committee. And that's why it's important that we that we take our preventative spend agenda right into the communities and say, well, if this is the resource we've got, if, this is, if he's, these are the options we've got, what's most likely to work for you? Now, that's a long way of saying the focus on outcomes is where this will actually start to bite. I think trying to, to strip out budget lines is probably not going to work. Well, we may, we may just overuse the term preventative. I, mean, right. I think we all do it, maybe. Yeah. That, but... But thanks uh, for your attendance here today. Um, uh, we appreciate it, and we are going to complete our report on that. And we look forward to the information that you offered during the session, um, and, and we'll be happy to uh, play a role as a committee in some of these uh, you know, challenging issues that we have. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed for your attendance. We now go into private session as previously agreed. Is that correct? Thank you.